What's up my fellow poker enthusiasts, it's Renee aka The Wacko here and together with my co-host Adam Carmichael we present to you the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In this podcast we deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. Over the years, me and Adam have gained a lot of experience in both reaching high stakes poker ourselves and teaching other players to do the same. We have bundled all this knowledge together in our coaching program, The Mechanics of Poker, which is the most complete poker coaching product on the market. If you want to have a chance to work with me and Adam so you can get unstuck and make more progress in your poker career, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. But without further ado, let's learn from another high stakes player's journey in today's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Mechanics of Poker podcast. We are very excited to start chatting with today's guest. But before we introduce him, we have a quick announcement. Because if you want to work with me and Adam and have us improve your poker career, now is the chance. Because during the next two weeks, applications for our Mechanics of Poker coaching program have reopened. We have a limited amount of spots to join the community. Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com, fill out the application, and maybe you'll get selected and take one of the available places. Okay, mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. Get a chance to work with me and Adam in the Mechanics of Poker 2.0 coaching program. Today, we will have a chat with Israeli and high-stakes player Barak Wisbrot. Barak started out as an MTT player and made the switch to cash games towards the end of 2021. Then within a year after switching, he was successfully at the highest stakes and became one of the bigger winners over at GG that year to follow. Very excited to learn from Barak's journey and how he managed to make the switch so smoothly. As always, I'm joined with my co-host, co-mechanics of poker coach, Mr. Mindset and Performance, Adam Carmichael. Adam, what are you specifically curious for chatting with Barak today? Yeah, I think it's interesting that he's been able to have success in two formats at a young age. He's often, he's obviously learned a lot of tools and tricks to uh, fast track his journey and his progression. So uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, understanding how he's been able to do that and what mindset he's been able to develop and performance habits along the way. So uh, yeah, we'll dive into his story, his journey and share some lessons for the audience. But before we start, I would like to give a big shout out to GTO Wizard for sponsoring today's podcast. We are proud to announce a technological breakthrough. Introducing GTO Wizard AI. This powerful technology can solve any custom poker spot in seconds to high accuracy. Unlike pre-solved solutions, this allows you to edit the solving parameters. That means you can modify the ranges, change the stack and pot sizes, customize the betting tree, and automatically simplify and optimize your bet sizes. Brace yourself. The meta is about to change. So sign up using the link below gtowizard.com slash mechanics and get 10% off your first month and join the weekly coaching webinars of which one every month is with me. I'm looking forward to educating you guys there. But without further ado, let's get into today's episode. There he is, Mr. Barrack. Thank you for joining the pod. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I'm happy to be here. Excited. Yeah, it, uh, I messaged you quite a, quite a while ago, so it took uh, took quite some convincing, but very happy that you decided to come on. I'm sure our audience will really appreciate it as well. Beric, when uh, we asked you what got you into poker, you actually mentioned it was because you were a bit of a degen. And that got me to think, how does the start of a degenerate poker player career look like? Okay, so... Yes, I was quite a DJ. Um, my friends can probably approve that. Um, so I think I started playing poker when I was like 13 or 14, actually, uh, for play money. Uh, my cousin, who uh, at the time was a very good friend of mine, uh, basically introduced me to the game and uh, we would play on Facebook. And I think even on Facebook, I was like a big DJ. I would like uh, break my bankroll like every day, basically play uh, until I bust or whatever, uh, until you get the extra chips on the next day. And then around the age of like 17, um, 
maybe 17, 18, I, I, I figure out, uh, oh, you can actually play for money. So I, I, I started playing on, on poker stars and I was quite bad, but I had an illusion that I, I'm good because, you know, you, you win in like a small tournament and then you think like, oh, I'm, I'm so fucking good in this game. But then you quickly realize that you're not. Um, and I think after depositing like 50 to a hundred dollars, like probably 10 to 20 times, um, I realized like, oh, there's probably, um, like there's probably some skill to this game. Like there, like, there must be something going on uh, over here. Um, and back at the time there was like a forum in Israel called uh, Pokerland. Um, and it was very popular. And a lot of the best Israeli pros were actually uh, talking about strategy over there, which was kind of insane if you think about it, um, because it was basically a very good content in Hebrew. Uh, and yeah, like I remember just reading a lot uh, about everything like cash games, uh, MTTs, uh, yeah, just surfing through the forums and uh, yeah, seeing what's going on. And then there would be like some guys who would sell action uh for like sunday sessions over there and i would just uh you, you had this feature this cool feature you, you can look up names on poker stars and see like the, if, if they have any deep runs so i would just open like some of the best pros and like watch them uh, as they play uh i remember, I remember it was very cool uh, i even bought action for like three percent five percent sometimes uh in my uh, yeah it was like a pretty big amount uh back then but i still did it um I said, at least that's, that's like profitable probably. And yeah, it was, uh, basically what happened is when I started playing for money, um, I actually started, uh, taking some coaching from a guy in that, uh, forum. Uh, and after a few sessions, I was already a winning, a uh, and go player. Um, so I was doing very well, even though I was probably a fish, but I still had like a decent clue about, uh, open jamming and re-jamming and whatever and some ICM and that was enough to beat like the, the low stakes back then and then at some point it was like uh, I, I just realized that every time what happens is I, I keep busting my bankroll because I'm let's say I'm having like a losing week then I just want to play bigger so let's say my average uh, buying was like eight dollars at the time then I would suddenly play like a uh, I don't know, like I had 1K in my account and I would play like a $200 hyper sit and go. Um, yeah, so I, I, I assume the, the, Rex, the Rex back then, they liked me because I, I would often uh, bust my bankroll in those hypers um, very quickly. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically uh, how it started for me. Like um, I would play pretty well in in my stakes but then i would just do something stupid to bust my bankroll um and to be honest i think uh, this brings like a deeper concept of uh, poker players especially poker players who come from an mtt background like i've i've been uh, to both of the worlds like mtts and cash games now and i think there is some different uh, in the characters of uh, mtt players and cash games like not all of them but um like i think mtt they have the they have like this uh self-destruct deep inside them i don't know how to like everyone has it in a different um uh, amount of power i guess and and something else triggers it for them but um it seems like the cash game players are usually more like in their character more solid people and like uh, nittier with with management and everything and then mtt guys they want to play bigger they want to take the shots they yeah, they wanna again, like definitely. You can talk about everyone, but it's just the way I see it, and the way I uh, see my friends are and and people that I know of. Uh, of. And then I think, uh, yeah, I just think uh, I I definitely had this self destruct mode deep inside me. Um, I'm not entirely sure where it came from and and exactly. Uh, why it happened and when it happened but i assume it was uh yeah it was just there and and it would often just come up um and i really needed to like lose my bankroll a lot of times 
like uh, my friend uh, likes to say that every poker player needs to lose uh, to go bust at least at least once. So I think I went bust at least like fifteen to twenty times. The the the, the thing is, um, all of those times came at a really young age. And I wasn't even a pro back then. I wasn't making a living off the game. Uh, I was basically uh, just before the the army, and then during the army, I was also playing. Uh, in Israel, you have to do three years of uh, military service. It's mandatory, so I was doing my service. And then, yeah, then basically um, after my military service, I knew already that. I want to go pro, like I want to do this for a living. Um, I've had poker friends from uh, from study groups, like from before the army, and I, and I would talk to them often. We we've become uh, good friends by now, and they already all made a lot of progress since the day we were playing like low stakes. And I really couldn't because I was basically in the military. And then uh, yeah, then uh, just. Uh, I just started, I basically told my parents that like, uh, like a few days after I, I got off the military that I'm going to do this for a living, like I'm going to go all in with it, like there is no other way. And we've already had a lot of fights about poker because they definitely didn't like the idea. And also I think they, they didn't know exactly, but I think they realized that I was doing some stupid shit, like going busto and stuff, because just by the way I was behaving and, and everything. And then... Uh, Basically, my dad, I remember he told me, my parents are, are awesome and they've been really supported, uh, really supportive my entire life about every, about most decisions I made uh, that aren't stupid, of course. Um, but back then they were like, um, yeah, like my, my dad told me like, listen, if you, if you want to go travel, if you want to do whatever, you can do whatever. But if you, if you want to uh, gamble for a living, then I'm not going to let you do that, at least not in my house. So I, I basically left, uh, you, you could say left, but I, I, I was kind of kicked out of my house <laughs> uh, when, I was, uh, when I was 22. Um, and I didn't have much money, but I probably had enough to pay rent for like an expenses for like uh, one year. So basically what I did was uh, basically decided that like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go all in with it. And there is no other choice. Like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to, I was super obsessed with the game uh, and everything that uh, involves the game. Uh, like studying, talking about every spot super deeply. Even before, like I'm talking like, this is not super long ago. It's only like five and a half years, and a half years ago. They, they probably had some solvers already, but I was not introduced to them. Um, and yeah, this is basically how it starts. Like I just started, uh, started playing uh, um, MTTs, like online, live, and figuring out if I, if I can do this. And I was basically, of course, I've had some setbacks, but I've, I've been pretty successful ever since. Yeah, you mentioned that because of your degenerate tendencies, you got into touch with poker, but you also mentioned after that, you stayed more for the love of the game, but still also kind of the adrenaline that poker can give you right and actually what, what you mentioned about mtt players i can imagine just the format mtt just you know you always have the dream of the of, you know the big money the big money score so i think naturally it draws maybe people in who are a bit more gambly like oh yeah but i can win very big today you know whereas cascade players are more like steady eddie you know every day so i i, I, I probably if you do i would love to see like a big survey amongst poker players and kind of see what personality traits are different in in different fields imagine like hyper hyper sitting goes these people are probably even more degenerate um you still have some of that degen or at least that chase for adrenaline you play a lot of short-handed three four-handed against some of the best players in the world is that still a bit that degen inside of you looking for that russian adrenaline or is that mainly the love of the game and competing against the best um I think it's uh, it's probably again I I've done a lot of work on this uh, I like I've done a lot of work on mental game in general but uh, or, or like mental for life as well I think um, and I think there is always gonna be a little part of me that is degen but I think one of my best uh, strengths 
is that I'm very self-aware. So if I'm tilted, I'm aware of it. If I'm feeling certain emotions, I'm aware of it. It doesn't always mean that I can control it or do something about it, but I'm very aware of, aware of the situation. And I think if I choose to play a certain game, um, sometimes there are lineups where I'm probably at best going to be break even or maybe slightly winning or slightly losing. Um, but most of the time, I think it's going to be, um, if I, if I play a certain game, a certain game, I think it's probably going to mean that I'm, that I think I'm going to win at it because, um, I have this thing, uh, that I'm, I'm a very intuitive person and I think, uh, intuitive person uh, means that like in, intuitive people are usually people who like, uh, they see something, something happening and then there is a result. And after a lot of times that these things happen, um, they, they kind of get the intuition of like one thing lead, leads to another. So if I'm playing a game and I see that I'm getting fucked every time, then I'm probably, uh, at some point going to realize that it's probably not very good for me. Um, so there would be certain games that I would avoid. Um, like heads up against certain players, for example, and then there would be, even though I haven't done a lot of heads up study, I think, uh, the game is super dynamic and there could be some opponents that I can beat, uh, even if they have done more studying than me. Um, but then I would, there would be like some guys and I would just see that like, uh, consistently there's just no way I can beat this guy and I would just not do it. Um, so I think, uh, to answer your question, it's, uh, it has to do a lot with the love of the game and just uh, when the stakes are very high, like you mentioned me playing uh, like three, four hundred with very good players. So yeah, when, when you can play nowadays like uh, 20 KNL with low rake, with, uh, with the best players, I'm definitely down for it. Um, yeah, there is just the love of the game, the adrenaline, but I also like, I just look at my results consistently and obviously if i'm getting crushed i'm not gonna keep playing that game um, you also mentioned if you have a good intuit like you kind of feel right when when you get even though the result might show something different you do feel if you're winning or not you feel if you're in control you feel if the things that you think will happen will actually also happen you know if you have like a certain game plan going in but every time other things happen, you're like, wait, wait, may maybe I'm missing something. But if things kind of go the way you expect them to go, the players play the way you expect it to play, you feel more in control, you feel more confident this way. Because, and also, I also ask you, because sometimes people ask me the question, then they show like, why are, why are these guys playing against each other, right? And I'm like, yeah, well, they probably, first of all, they are all competitive people, right? They all love to compete. But most probably if you ask anyone, everyone will say the same like, and this is, this is so nice about poker, right? Everyone will probably say, well, I think I'm at, maybe I'm break even, but probably I'm a winner. And everyone <laughs> says that a winner. That, that's so nice about yeah. poker. Yeah. I think, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Like a friend asked me, like, I'm, I'm actually not, uh, quite the, the battler guy. Like there would be guy who battle a lot more than me. I've just started doing it recently more. Um, but I think it's like, uh, if you ask anyone in that uh, field, he's probably going to say he's winning or like break evening, uh, which doesn't make sense unless everybody is exactly break even. Um, but I think there, there are a few things that uh, lead us to play those games, I guess. One of them is just when you play the higher stakes. Um, so there would be like 5k games running probably every day. But then when you go to 10k, 20k, 40k, there would not always be good action like now there is good action but there would be like weeks sometimes months with no action no action and then some of the guys who already don't play 5k um they basically have no action and they want to they want to practice you can call it they want to play they want to be in good shape uh and also they love the game uh and also when you have no action and you're just open sitting like uh, empty tables all day with nothing to do, then uh, it, it's nice to sometimes have like one, two hours of action even, and then sometimes like a recreational can jump in and play and join the game or whatever. And these things actually happen. 
like sometimes. So I think it's uh, as long as it's a low rake environment, I think it's probably for most of the players in that game, it's probably sustainable. And yeah, they're, they're probably like break evening or like uh, slightly winning or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's 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 a lot. It's it's also very cool. It's very dynamic. Like you get the best players in the world, but uh, you would expect maybe one would expect that they are gonna just be like robots playing uh, perfect theory against each other. But I think it's far from that, and there is a lot more to it. And it's 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 a lot of fun. It's very cool. Um, like you said, it's it it's like the most uh, adrenaline you can get. It's it's the best. Yeah, for sure. And I think especially you know what I personally like. Uh, from three-handed play, I would say that's probably probably my favorite because like when the other positions come in, there's just so many equity setups that you're a bit handcuffed. Like the equities of the range, they kind of handcuff you in what you can do or not. But when you play three-handed, there's there's way less spots where the equity is so much in one's favorite. So you can always just you, there's just way more room to play around, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So nowadays, uh, as you mentioned, most of your volume comes from cash games, but you did start out playing NTTs. Why did you decide to play NTTs in the beginning and what made you decide to, I think it was, you mentioned uh, 2021, switch to cash games? So, yeah, going back to that uh, one year after the army, I was playing NTTs because that's basically what I knew about. I was playing some cash games here and there, but I wasn't any good at it. Um, and then basically my uh, first cash games uh, experience as like a pro were like traveling to like Cyprus or like Vegas or whatever and or like Europe and just you're playing like a tournament series and then you would have days where you just passed early or like a day with no tournament and you want to make some money. So you just go and sit down to play a cash game. And usually those games are pretty soft and um, one could say they actually have, you, you can make more money per hour in those games, uh, which I agree. And it's, it's also much more stable. And I always had like friends who play cash. So I would just uh, play for a few hours, discuss some hands with them, uh, see the differences and all of that. But I was basically focusing on, on MTTs and I've been pretty successful. And then uh, basically after that year, I, I realized that, okay, like this is going well, I can do that. And then I decided to go to Vegas for the first time. And that was a big, uh, very big uh, climb for me because uh, basically a good friend of mine told me, listen, it's uh, like everybody was telling me, listen, Vegas is, is rough. Like you, you wanna be very careful with the first time you should go for like two, three weeks just to experience, play the main, whatever, and be very careful. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I should, uh, like a friend of mine who is playing cash games told me he's going for three months. And he was a very good friend of mine. And he told me, listen, let's let's do this. Let's go for three months. You're going to play cash games uh, for like uh, 30 days or like 35 days. And then uh, WSOP starts. You just grind the tournaments, do your thing, and you can earn like money stably by playing like for 30 days. And then worst case scenario, uh, you're not going to go broke. Like you're going to lose uh, a decent amount in MTTs, but you you can win like a bunch before that. So I, I thought the idea was cool. So I went for it. And it was pretty funny because on my second day, uh, there was like some uh, spring series or whatever. Uh, going on at the, at the win and I actually managed to win a $400 tournament for like 30k which at the time I think was my biggest win um, or something uh, around my biggest win uh, and it, it was my first live win and I, I, I think this was it was maybe one of the happiest moments of my life probably like winning my first live trophy and it was it was uh, followed by a month of just bringing break even in cash <laughs> So my plan didn't didn't go. Uh, my, my plan of like uh, making a bunch of money in cash games didn't go well. Uh, and then the series came, and I was basically running super hot. Uh, I think I was super confident and playing uh, well, especially like at least uh, I, I think I was playing well. I don't know. 
uh, maybe I was I was still not very good back then, but uh, relatively to what I was playing, I think I was pretty good. And I've actually won like four tournaments that summer, uh, which was wow. kind of insane. Yeah, it was like the four hundred dollar at the at the win for like. 30k followed by like a 600 dollar at the Venetian for like 40k, uh, 1k at the Venetian for like 100k, and then uh, the tag team uh, event uh, for a world, for WSOP bracelet with two of uh, my good friends, uh, which was also very very cool, uh, very nice, and I even had like the biggest final table of my life back then, uh, at least until that moment it was like a. 1.6k event at the win uh with like 500k for first and i got uh like i got it in like ace jack suited against ace four suited or something and busted ninth and i remember like this was a big uh a big moment in my mental career because i remember like basically what happens in mtts i think is most people they run deep and then they have uh like let's say you're like one out of 20 in a big tournament and then you have like this huge expectation you're already dreaming of like oh like uh, there is like 100k 200k 1 million up top doesn't matter and you have that amount in your mind already you're thinking about it some it may affect their games some it doesn't but i think as long as you have that expectation and then realistically you can just bust two hours after that or like three hands later um that can be really really painful and i remember like that uh, final table, even though it was followed by basically me going to Vegas and 10xing my bankroll or something during that trip, um, I still, I was so disappointed. Like, I remember I basically became sick. It was like the last day of my Vegas trip. And I, I had to like pack and uh, uh, do all those kinds of arrangements before my flight. And I remember I was just lying sick in bed, just couldn't get up. And maybe i was just getting the flu but i think it had also something to do with just being really really disappointed. like even though it was like a, still a great result i think it was like 50k from a 1.6k tournament but at the moment you just feel like somebody crushed your soul i don't know um so this was a very very big experience for me because ever since i've been really really careful with having expectations i think ever since basically it's never happened like i've had so many deep runs uh like i remember being like one out of ten in a big live mtt with like 40 percent of chips and busting ninth and not even like punting just getting cooler um and i was so okay with it like i was obviously obviously disappointed but like now i just realized these things happen and it's just a part of the experience and there is not much you can do about it and also going back to what i said before i think mtt guys they need to you know they need to acknowledge the pain like there is so much pain to it so let's say you sit down and you play a cash game. And let's say a, a cash game guy is having a downswing, losing like 30 binds, 50 binds, I don't know. It can be pretty uh, painful. I'm not saying you're not going to have uh, rough moments, but if you're an MTT guy and you're losing 500 binds or like you're losing for like one or two years, this is like, this is uh, very painful. And this is one of the reasons why I left MTTs. Um, so basically what happened is uh back then i was uh thinking i want to play mostly live because i felt like uh, live mtts are so good and i like like going traveling to many uh, stops um and i was doing really well basically i i after that vegas trip i went to cyprus uh there is a cool place called merit and i won the main event basically back to back like two trips in a row for like 160 180k each um which is again like kind of insane an insane run um and yeah basically then covid happens and no more live stops so i was kind of not sure what to do but then online poker boomed so i was again playing online mtts and was doing okay i think i have a, I had a solid uh, year at uh, covid but then uh I realized like this is not working like i don't enjoy the online streets uh, as much anymore uh especially when it means uh i mean the online mtt streets especially when it means going to sleep like with my israeli uh, time zone it means like you have to go to sleep at like five six seven eight a.m every day uh, if you want to grind it and 
for me, it was not sustainable because it basically would fuck my life. Um, I was trying to get like a routine going of like just leaving like, I'm not saying like waking up 6 a.m., but at least, you know, waking up like 11 a.m. or like 12, something like that, and being able to uh, to have a social life, being able to, I don't know, uh, doing some stuff other than studying and playing. And it was very hard. So I was thinking, hmm, maybe I could... Uh, Maybe I could try something else. Maybe I can try to get into cash games. And then uh, uh, a, f- a mutual friend connected me to uh, Uri Peleg, uh, which uh, you've already talked to. And basically, um, him and a great uh, group of coaches uh, shifted my game from playing. I wasn't really a beginner because I started playing like I already had a lot of money and experience and I um, basically started playing like 1K when I moved to cash games like 5-10. And I was doing already pretty well um, playing those games. And then what happens is my game just shifted really quickly uh, from playing those games to like playing, like taking a shot at 5K on GG. And then having taken a shot at 5K, and seeing that things are going well for one, two, three months, I said, okay, I mean, usually what happens in high stakes is there is a big gap between the mid stakes to high stakes. So if you play 5, 10 or 10, 20, it's really hard to go up to play 5K because what happens is there are, first of all, there is a, a lot less action in 25, 50 compared to like 5, 10. And second, the games are much tougher. Um, also, because there is a lot less action than people play fewer tables, they are much more focused. Whereas if you play 5, 10 people, maybe they play, especially on GG, they, they could play like 10 to 15 tables or something to grind the rate back stuff or whatever. And I think it's, it's much tougher to play the higher games. And then this gap is really hard to, uh, to go through. And for me, I don't know, it, it kind of... I've always been on the side of like I said DJ, but yeah, like at that point I'm already taking like uh, smart shot taking. I I would say because I had a lot of money from MTTs. Uh, I'm I I just wasn't sure that I have the skill that is required. Um, but once I figure out that I do, then basically when you play the high stakes, then often twenty five fifty and fifty one hundred, it's almost the same lineup. Uh, so you just then I started playing 5100, and I basically saw that my results were even better because it's the same lineup, but uh, the rake is lower. And then there would be like a 100-200 game. Uh, so whenever there was a really good spot, I started playing those games. And then I realized that, again, like the results just get better because often it's it's like a very similar lineup, but it's, uh, it's much lower rake. Um, and I guess 100, 200 is exactly the cutoff point where the games become uh, start to become much tougher because some of the guys who play 5K regularly uh, don't want to play. Uh, but people who, like the, the, the very top guys, they, they, they do want to play. So like if they see there is some 20K or 40K action going on regularly, they would just show up. Uh, they, would, they would start showing up every day, which doesn't always happen. Um, so... Yeah, and then it peaked at the, uh, it basically, I, I've had like a really good year and it peaked with like the Imagine King games at the end of the 2021. Basically, uh, if, yeah, I'll, I'll just say it's like some kind of Chinese guy who showed up and he started playing uh, 2550, like three tables, and then he moved up to 5100 and then 100, 200, 200, 400. I think he even played like one or two sessions of higher than that, but most of the games were like uh, 20K and 40K. And uh, when it was 40K, it was basically really tough lineups. It's basically uh, the same guys almost show up every day. Uh, you could see like uh, Kevin, uh, Linus, um, uh, Ignacio, uh, Dudi, um, yeah, like David Jones, uh, Darrell, like literally all of, the, all of the very top guys, they would just show up every day. Like Marcus Leipzig, um there would be like, uh, yeah, there would be like a six table with almost uh, the same lineup. Um, and 
then uh, it, it was very it was very nice because even though we had this uh, rack at the table it was still very hard because the rake is still uh, it, it's, it's already much lower but it's still if you compare it to different sides it's, it's it was still pretty high um and you're playing like literally the best players in the world so i i, I actually I, I think i also ran pretty hot during that like two, one two months but i think i was uh probably at the top of my game of, of my game back then just being really really sharp uh studying and being very consistent and i also i think i have i had like a really good routine uh during that times uh so yeah i, I was super happy um to be able to yeah to do that well that's a that's a very impressive story adam i'm sure uh you have some questions from mr barrack silently uh listening on the sideline yeah i'm super curious to uh map out how you went from this degenerate gambler sort of spewing off buy-ins going broke starting out to this really calm calculated a high stakes guy we see today. So you mentioned that you went broke like 15, 20 times starting out. First, the question that comes to mind is how were you uh, funding yourself to keep re rebuying, but also um, what was going through your mind as you were continuing to uh, take shots and fail a poker early on? Can you remember some of the thought processes you were having? So it's quite interesting because I was a completely different person, I think. I was like 17, 18 years old. Uh, it was probably like for, for like a few years that it happened, those things. Um, and I was basically uh, very emotional, I guess. I would just have a lot of emotions going on and not super aware of some of them. I was still a very uh, self-aware person in general, but I think I, I just didn't know some of those things happened. Um, I didn't realize they were happening and i just i was super obsessed with the game like i i i think at first it was just like the gambling part and maybe some part of me uh, deep inside i just need i think we all sometimes we we need to lose uh, i don't know how to explain it exactly but um there is there is this uh, again self destruct uh, uh system in in all of us but i just think some people it's very minor for them and some people it's it's really large um so for me i think back then it was really large um not really sure why and then basically what happens is uh i was lucky because back then i was playing really small so if i was busting like a one two five k bankroll it's not a big deal whereas let's say if today like you bust like i don't know like let's say someone who's playing mid stakes or like high, like high stakes and he bust like a 500k roll i don't know how you can recover from that um it's gonna be really 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 tough um and yeah I, I was just a kid i think i was a kid physically and mentally and luckily for me i had really really uh I had some close friends who are really really uh nitty and they really uh cared about me and i remember having a lot of conversation with them uh, about like uh you can't do this like this is not like how it's supposed to go like maybe this is not for you um they they, actually, they really actually cared about me which was very good uh whereas i think some other people they could be in different environments uh, and i could be led to a diff to an entire different lifetime uh let's say i don't know uh, i had a friend who told me listen like, like just uh, i don't know like take a loan and, and and play again or whatever and then i could find myself in depth uh, so yeah i think it's uh it's super crucial um and and it was very very helpful for me um and also ever since i've also done like a lot of uh, uh basically work on myself just as a person so going to a therapist uh, uh for years um and doing some mental game coaching uh doing all this kind of stuff and also just evolving as a person just like um Basically, when I don't know how most therapists uh, work, but for me, it's like whenever I'm seeing my therapist, he's like, he's basically putting a mirror to my life and showing me like, listen, you, uh, I'm telling him some stuff. And then he's saying, listen, you're doing this because of ABC. So what you should do is just, you should first pay attention to it. And then I would basically what happens today is after like a long progress already, um, 
what happens is in, in even in my life, I would go uh, and let's say somebody said something to me on the street and it would give me like a certain emotion. And then I would say like, oh, this is not happening because of me or him. This is just happening because uh, this brings like a, a certain system inside me that uh, makes me feel this way. And it's okay. Like, this is who I am. It's, it's, it's fine. Like, I, I should just uh, know that it's there and how to handle it, not that it control me. So I think this also uh, uh, brings a lot of uh, good stuff to the poker mental game. Because again, like, let's say I get cooler then I, I, I start feeling this pain inside and I say like, okay, like, was there anything I could do? No, then it's okay. I should feel pain. Like I just lost a big amount of money or like I busted out of a deep run, but it's, it's fine. It's, it's a part of the process. It's, it's all good. Um, and then I think the problem starts when you make, uh, uh mistakes, like, um, and, and then that's much harder to, that was the part that was much harder for me. Like, I think I was very unforgiven to myself. So I would make a mistake. I remember one huge mistake I, I made in a live tournament where I just didn't pay attention to a guy's stack size. And it, if I did pay attention, the spot was super easy. And then I literally got, I, I busted like uh, a tournament. And I remember I was just unable to play for days. I was basically on mega tilt for like two or three days, something that never happened to me because I don't know, like, I was just like, I, I was feeling I'm so much better than this. How did I not pay attention? How did I do this? And then we, again, with just walking on myself as a person and learning to uh, forgive myself for in real life mistakes, um, I learned that it's okay. Like, I'm going to make mistakes every day in poker, in life, in whatever. And it's just okay. And I think this was the biggest uh, um I guess, uh, how does, I don't know how to say it, but like the, the biggest progress, I guess I made as, as a person and, and as a poker player, because then it just, uh, brought me from, a uh, certain, uh, point where I can, you know, I can make mistakes and then it's going to be like, the mistakes are going to be there. And if I'm going to get tilted every time, then it, it's, it's, it's not going to work. But nowadays, um, uh, of course, I can get uh, upset with mistakes, but I'm just going to uh, see the positive side in it. First of all, uh, just learning more and more to forgive myself and realizing that it happens every day. And second, just, okay, I made a mistake. How do I improve from that point? What can I do to not make it again? Um, and I think often we also make mistakes, like not one, not two, even like five times until we learn how to do it. Some people, they do it, uh, they can do it after one time. For me, it's, it's usually a bit slower. I need, I need to, I need to do it like two or three times. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, that, that's basically, uh, long story short. That's my, that's my process. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. That was a mindset masterclass and it answered a lot of questions. I had in my mind about how someone goes from a degenerate kind of gambling nature to build the mindset that's actually very tolerant to risk and very balanced. And as you mentioned there, first of all, you had some good friends around you to uh, strike that right balance to push back on you. I think when you've got degenerate tendencies, you kind of walk on a knife edge a little bit. One, you kind of want to back yourself, but also uh, you're a bit of a loose cannon who could like go off the rails in, in a bad situation. So it's good to have someone around you to uh, stress test you, make sure you're not taking on too much risk, which sounds like you had. But I think the main skill that you really learn is going deep into yourself and exploring. You said you already had the self-awareness, but you definitely fine tuned that skill in understanding like the triggers and responses, I call them, where life's in, you're interacting with life and things are triggering emotional responses. What's going on there? What's causing these emotions coming me inside of me? me, how to understand them better and how to learn to uh, stay calm in the face of them. And then you mentioned like the kind of a big one for you, which I think a lot of players can relate to uh, making mistakes. One of the real biggest triggers I, I experienced working with players, not forgiving themselves, being very hard on themselves when they make mistakes. And you mentioned learning to forgive yourself and then also uh, kind of directing your attention to uh, how can I improve from this mistake? So for yourself in terms of things that maybe bother you now, is there anything that still causes any emotions, anything that you still need to be uh, mindful of or aware of as you're going for your poker career? Um, I would say it's, it's all of those stuff, but just, uh, they are much less like empowered, I guess they are just much smaller. So I would still 
uh, get cooler, then I would mumble a few bad words or whatever, think it's okay. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's just important for one to uh, realize um, what his problems are and just like focus on how he can improve them. Um, for me, I guess right now it's like, uh, it, it, it's, it's those things just in, in minor cases, I would say, like I get cooler in a big spot or like, uh, I would make a stupid call down or like a stupid bluff or like whatever. And I would be, uh, I would be feeling some negative emotions, but I would know how to handle it and, and just move on and, and save that handy story for later. Uh, or maybe like what, what happens often is, uh, Nowadays, like whenever I play cash, then I would have like two, one to two, three friends actually who play in the same pools every day, and I would share some. Uh, I, I I can sometimes even share and history like right at the moment, like I just played a hand, and I would like I have a friend at the at the table or like playing a different table, but he's online. I would just share it at the moment, and then like he would be like, oh, you, you played it uh, fine. You, even though like I, I thought like I just made a big punt or whatever. And he said, no, no, it's actually okay. And then those, those kind of things, uh, or like he's actually, he, he can say like, it's, it's actually a big punt when you think about it now, but in game, I could have made the same uh, thing. Like I can see where you're coming from or, or whatever. So I think, uh, yeah, I think in general, this, this helps a lot also. Um, yeah. But, but I don't know. Nowadays, I feel like at least on the mental part, I believe there is always room for improvement, but um, I feel pretty confident in that area, at least. Mm. Yeah, I like the avenues you covered there. One from the self-awareness of understanding your own responses, but then also again, inputs from other players, other people. Very often we're so in our own heads, we are caught up in our own problems that we can't see the kind of clarity of the situation as well. So getting someone else to uh, either let you know you've made a mistake or to show some sympathy often helps a lot with our kind of uh, process of forgiving ourselves and rationalizing what we're trying to do. I'm very really curious to know um, how your relationship with risk has changed as your career has progressed. So let's say at the start of your career, definitely that to generate kind of risk taker. How has your relationship to risk changed? Because obviously from the outside, you're still taking big risks. You're playing some of the high stake games in tough lineups. How do you feel like you've altered how you take risks and how do you kind of view uh, uh, what the factors that contribute to taking risk? So it's a good question. Um... I think um, it's it's kind of interesting because nowadays I basically split my action into two. Like I would play, I guess, a similar amount of MTTs and cash games nowadays, um, at least for now. Um, and it changes a lot. But the, the main idea, I think, would be to uh, realize what kind of bankroll management rules work for you. Not what kind of bankroll management rules somebody told you or you've seen on a course. That would be a good baseline uh, to start from. But then, like for me, for example, like I, people ask me, like, what do you think is a proper bankroll management for cash games? And I would say I have no, I have no idea. Like I don't know. It could be forty binds, it could be twenty binds, it could be two hundred binds. I, I really don't know. It depends on which game you're playing, what edge you have in that game. Um, uh i don't know like how many tables you're playing like what what are your commitments as a person do you have like a family do you have kids to feed uh do you have like a mortgage i don't know there could be so many factors in that system and so for me i'm single uh i don't have many commitments uh i pay rent and maybe i have some investments going or whatever but other than that uh yeah not many not many commitments so Basically, what I'm thinking is I just want to have the most action of myself possible of whatever I'm playing, even if it means taking some big shots. Uh, but the reason I'm being able to do it is just because uh, basically in whatever field I was playing, I've been really, I've been winning a lot and been really consistent. Um, so I'm basically saying like, unless something changes, I'm just going to take big risks. Uh, so let's say if the if the scale of uh, bankroll management is between I don't know twenty to two hundred binds, I would be much closer to two to twenty binds, for example. And I remember having like uh, nowadays it's like it takes like a really big game or like a really big tournament for me to to start selling action. But I remember 
when I was considering like taking a bigger shot and I would actually take some really big shots uh, to play like a really good high game, high stakes game just because I felt like if I lose those one, two, three, four, five binds today, it's going to be really painful, but I can handle it and I can just do like some kind of reset. And I've done it a few times. Like I've had like at least 10 days in my life or like 15 days over the last couple of years where I lost like a huge amount where some people would say like in percentage of bankroll, it's like illegal to lose this amount or whatever. But basically it was followed by me uh, going back to the office the next day and saying, okay, I just took a really big hit. That's okay because I, I made a good decision. Um, and that's and also another thing that is important is does it affect your game? So if you, let's say you're, it, it's too big for you and, and it's starting to affect your game, that's then obviously you want to selection. Um, and yeah, I think for me, it's, it's been really good this way because every time something like that happened, I came back much stronger. Like I came back, I grinded, I grinded it back up, not like really back up because it's not like I lost 80% of my bankroll or anything, maybe just something like five to 10%. Um, and then I would just be like, uh, yeah, starting over. If it was like a 200, 400 game, I, I would play 25, 50 the next day and would only jump into higher games if I sell action or if the game is really, really good or whatever. And once there were like games, like I said, with Imagine Kings, they, they ran consistently and super high games and a lot of tables, then I would sell a lot of action. I think it's only like natural to do it this way. So I think uh, for successful players out there, I would say uh, you want to take shots. You want to be aggressive with shots, even for tournaments uh, or cash games, even to tournaments, it's, it's a lot more, it's, it's different. Uh, I can expand some more about it, but um, yeah, like you, you just want to, as long as you don't have many commitments, you just want to take uh, the risks. And again, like this is as long as you can afford uh, the mental uh, pain of, of, uh, of those uh, expenses um, or those losses. Um, and I, this is, I think, just the process of yourself. You have, to, you have to try different things. Of course, don't play for 50% of your bankroll, but just try to be a bit more aggressive than you are if you're doing well and see how you feel. If you're, yeah. let's say you, you, now, you now had like a huge loss. How do you feel the same day? How do you feel the next day? How is your like, how do you feel when coming back to the tables and play lo lower uh, or like selling action for the same game or whatever? And, and just seeing how that feels and, and being always super dy dynamic about it. Because I think what I see is that, for example, I have some, uh, some friend who is a really successful MTT player um, and he's selling, I think, too much action. And that is way, that's okay. But I think like I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Maybe that's a system that works for him. Uh, but if I was doing uh, that system and not trying to be as aggressive as I am with the management, then I think uh, I would be, uh, I would have much less money than today. And one could say that maybe, you know, maybe I also ran good during my career and maybe things could be different for sure. But I just believe the approach is, is good. Just, uh, yeah, like I remember like last year I had like a really big downswing and I remember just uh, basically what happened it, is it, it was the best thing ever. It was the best thing ever happened to me because I had like a downswing for six months after the best year in my career. Basically, I started 2022 with winning a lot of money and then losing it all back in six months. So basically around... Uh, Around September, I was break even for the year and I was really nervous about it because I said like, this is pretty sick. Like I was up like, I don't know, like uh, uh, a sick amount after three months and then like just losing it all in six months, like what's going on? And then I started to analyze like what happened during those six months. And I realized I wasn't studying as much. I was uh, traveling back and forth to like uh, live stops. And all of those things really uh, hurt my game because what happens is I'm going to play a live stop. Then it takes me like, that's at least how it is for me. It takes me like one to two weeks just to, uh, to see, uh, to, to get into my best form of playing live or like to a decent form of playing live now because the game is different. And then I would go back to online and the same thing happens. And then in between, you drop a lot of buys, whether you're playing MTTs or cash games, you're just playing, leaving a lot of EV over there. And I realized, okay, this is not for this is not working for me. 
I should do something about it. Then I realized, okay, I'm just going to go back into the lab, back into the cash game streets, and I'm not going to travel for a while. I remember this was, I'm not like, a, like the, the kind of guy who likes to plan uh, long ahead. Like people ask me like uh, what I'm, what I'm going to do next week. And it's hard for me to, to say, uh, but I remember back then it was September and I said like, until March, I'm going to stay at home. Like I'm not going anywhere unless it's like a vacation or something, but I'm definitely not going to play a live stop. And, and it was like that. And for six months, I've basically, uh, maybe I, I, I went for like three days of live some at some point, but for six months, I, ba I basically stayed in Israel, uh, starting playing. And ever since I've had the biggest upswing ever. Um, and I realized like, okay, this is the system that works for me. This is what I need to do. Um, so then I decided, okay, now I'm, I want to play some live. So I basically uh, planned ahead to do like uh, two weeks of EPT Monte Carlo, two weeks of Triton in Cyprus, and then uh, the entire Vegas uh, uh, trip, as long as I have the, um, I still have the energy to do it. And that's basically what happened. And I, I think it was my best, my best Vegas ever, because I, I came with the, with already being uh, into the live streets after one month of, of prior to that. And I was in a very good mental state. I had really good results. Um, yeah, just everything clicked. And I think this is super important, like just figuring out what's good for you. And to do that, you need to try different things. Uh, you need to really listen to yourself and see like how you feel about certain things. And um, sometimes uh, some people, I think the, the biggest problem is they are not aware of, of, of those things. Or some people would even be aware and they just don't know how to handle it. Like certain emotions, certain uh, feelings. So I think this is like one of my best friends, uh, strengths, sorry, just being able to communicate about these things with different players, communicate about it with myself, always, uh, like, like I said, just being like very, uh, results oriented in a, in a good way for once, just like saying, oh, this brings good results. Maybe I should do this more, uh, like in Vegas this year, I got into doing coach hours. And I would do like, uh, I don't know, five to seven minutes of cold shower every day um, until I, at, at some point I, I, I was sick and I just couldn't. Um, but uh, it was so good because I would see like, it gets me started in a really good way. And then I also eat healthy because I'm saying, oh, like I, I, I was super focused and super present all day because of those cold showers and because of uh, like consistency in, in, in waking up at a certain time. and and trying to arrive at the tables early and, and doing all of this kind of stuff. And then one brings, uh, one thing brings another good thing. You're just mm -hmm. doing well in, in, in different areas. And yeah, for me, it was, it was amazing. Like mm -hmm. I, I felt it myself and also, uh, my roommate, uh, in Vegas, who is a really good friend told me the same, like he felt like for both of us, uh, mentally, it was definitely the best Vegas, um, for both of us. So it, it, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I think it highlights really importantly how much you need to find what works for you. And I really like how you framed the downswing as the best thing to happen to you because that downswing was a catalyst moment to go, right, what I'm doing is not working. I'm doing these live stuffs, I'm doing it online. I'm kind of in between both and I'm not performing optimally in either. The system I've created to perform at a high level isn't working. I need to reassess this. I need to uh, lock myself away, focus on online for a bit and then reevaluate the online stuff, the, the, the live stuff, sorry. So uh, you have yourself are really trying to uh, double down on what works and find that system for yourself. And I think anyone watching this who is going through a downswing or listening to this, uh, can use the same kind of philosophy to go, right, what's what's not working right now? And what do I need to change? What do I control in this situation? And how can I change some things in my environment or how I'm approaching things to uh, see some forward motion? Hi guys, Rene aka The Weko here with a quick Mechanics of Poker 2.0 announcement because we are currently open to receive 10 new players in our Mechanics of Poker coaching program. In our program, you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player. Now, one of these, of course, is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. 
And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. Our mindset and performance coach Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt and play your A game more consistently. And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? And will you take one of the 10 available seats? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com and apply for the program. And maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. I'm really curious to you, for you, because obviously um, listening to you speak, it's clear you've got a very high tolerance for risk. And you mentioned like some factors in terms of your life circumstances, uh, the games you play, the, the kind of overall uh, being young and not much commitments overall, you're in a situ situation where you maybe can take more risk than the average person. But you also mentioned something important that you said, I can handle it. I mean, I can handle when things go badly. I'm interested to know, um, how do you handle when you take risks and things go badly? You mentioned like 10 or 15 days when things got a bit scary and not, not so great recently. Because when you've got this kind of high risk uh, kind of approach, you've got to almost like factor in that you've almost gone for the, for the extreme downs as well in terms of the swings. So uh, for yourself, how do you uh, handle really big swings and what are some of the things you do to uh, keep yourself sane and mentally active? That's a good one. Um, so I think like if I look back at some of those days, um, first of all, I think some of them, uh, I was probably not performing very well. Uh, I remember like there was a day where I was playing, uh, like the night before I went out with friends, uh, getting drunk, whatever, and then waking up the next day and action was insane. Uh, and just sit down and play, for example. So it just goes back to, Again, we, we have, even though sometimes we have zero responsibility of what happened, uh, well, we, we could have some, but um, sometimes it's even zero. Uh, things just happen. I think we, I still like to take accountability for myself, even uh, when things uh, go wrong in a variance kind of matter, which I think is, is a really uh, good skill. Uh, it might be going a bit too harsh on yourself, but I think in general, it's a good approach uh, for poker because it it just it it makes you more committed to improve even more um that's at least how i see it uh, so i think it's a it's a really good uh uh thing that i have in my character uh that's deep inside me but um uh, yeah I, I just lost track of thought so yeah i think it's um i think if i look back at how i felt let's say like i had a huge losing session how I felt uh, right after and how I felt the day after. So I think right after, I would, I would just feel like a big amount of pain. It's just like, um, like I don't know, you just, uh, you just don't want to do many things. You just want to sit there. Uh, and there would be uh, probably uh, some maybe healthier ways to deal with it. Maybe some meditation, maybe some, uh, yeah, I don't know uh talking to friends or whatever usually i would talk to friends i some people they they i think again like you need to figure out what's working for you in that way but in a way that it's not uh uh destructive neither for you and your friends because there would be someone who is gonna share it with his friends in a way that ah oh, listen i just lost like 100k uh, i hate my life blah blah blah. look at this hand that i lost and this is not helpful like this is not like uh even if you if you even if you give the same amount of information like i could send a, a hand to my friend and see like 
at least like look look what just happened like this is insane um but i would just had like a few laughing smiles or whatever uh, just just to light it up just to make it seem like because i'm not the kind of guy who likes to uh, cry about these things i almost never share bad be- bad bits or or anything like that i don't see any i don't see anything useful about it um but i actually have a friend who does it um and He's not getting tilted by it. It's just helping him to release. So again, I think uh, for him, for, exa- for, for example, it, it, it works good, but for his friends, it doesn't. Um, so I think just being able to, uh, to realize that you're feeling pain and that's okay. That's okay. You just need to, to go through it. Like, let's say uh, you went on a date and you got rejected. That's, that's fine. Like, most of the time when you're going on a first date, it's just not going to work. I don't know, unless you're like some kind of magician. Um, and, and it's going to happen in, in a lot of aspects of life. Like you're just going to, you're just going to feel like a uh, failure. The hard part I think about poker is sometimes you're going to perform at your best, but the result is going to suck. And that's the, that's the hard part. But I think once you go through enough of these uh, swings, you just, I don't know, for me, it's kind of natural. Like, I would just feel the pain sometimes for me, like if it's really extreme, I would have like emotional eating. It's not like I'm just going to eat like three kilos of food. Around. I would get like ice cream or like a pancake or whatever, just eat something nice, uh, like watch some Netflix. I don't know, just chill, sit with some friends. Um, yeah, try to try to just take it easy for like uh, 12 to 24 hours. Uh, probably not play again. Even though I've I've had some like there was like this recreational who played for like two days, and he would basically jump in and out like five times a day during those two days, and it was a really big game, and I remember losing like a huge amount um, after like two sessions, and then like it's also very hard because now I have to sell action, and now every dollar I'm gonna win back is only gonna be fifty cents, so it's 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 kind of tough. Uh, but I, I just realized, okay, if I'm going to jump back in, I'm, I'm going to have to do it. And I, I think I even won like a decent amount back, but I was just, again, like just responsible enough to do it and experienced enough to do it. Um, so again, I think it's, it's just like, yeah, we have like a certain, like poker is a profession. Like we have to, we have to respect it and we have to treat it as one. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think in general, just acknowledging the pain and, and, uh, going through it that's just i think yeah life is not all uh rainbow and sunshines you have to go through some pain you have to go through some failures you have to go through some mistakes through some bad faces that's okay but you just mm-hmm. have to to keep going you just have to keep uh keep doing your thing and uh if you trust the process and you trust yourself to do it good things are gonna happen yeah i think you've touched on something really important here of experience and pain and I think we're very, very often averse to pain. We move away from it. It was funny, I just went in the ice bath before this um, conversation at the gym and someone jumped in with me for like three seconds, then jumped out. I was like, oh, the pain got too much that you didn't want to experience it. It's funny, we just we move away from pain. And often when play, poker players experience pain, they want to numb it, they want to distract themselves. It sounds like for you, you uh, allow yourself to experience pain. Obviously, occasionally you'll do things to uh, maybe lower it. But I think you use pain as a kind of a guide to uh, reflect on, to move forward. And I think once we realize everything we experience, good, bad, is kind of fleeting. We have moments of joy, moments of happiness, moments of pain. And it's, there's nothing to run away from. It's just like experiencing it. I think that's one of those sort of things, like as we speak about it, some people will not understand like how, what we're trying to say, like experiencing pain, like what does that actually mean? So for you, uh, how do you uh, tolerate pain, right? It's like say it's, we're quite averse as humans to uh, going through a painful experience. How do you allow yourself not to overreact, right? So let's say you've had this really bad session, you're in a bit of pain, the mind's getting overactive. What are some of the things you do in those kind of six to 12 hours that allows you to be with the pain or to uh, uh, reflect on the pain in a more uh, practical way? So for me, it's kind of funny. Um, I actually have a friend who likes to say that uh, he can, he's a live player and he likes to say that like when he's looking at someone during a live stop, he can basically say if he's doing well during the trip in, in two seconds and also like if he's doing well today, like if he had a session today and if he's winning or losing. And he's, he's pretty accurate about it. Like I remember a bunch of times where he like whispered to me like, listen, he's like winning or he's losing. 
and then it, it came out to be right. Um, and and about me is is usually saying like I I almost don't notice it about you, um, which for me is is like a big compliment because it's basically what I'm trying to achieve. Um, so I think basically what I'm trying to do is first of all uh, feeling it. So first of all I would quit the session and at some point and then I would just okay like what now? Um, so I would just walk around the house. I don't know, feeling starting to feel the pain. It's going to be right here. <laughs> um, and then I would realize, like, I would talk to myself or, like, share with a friend that I was doing really badly and maybe I could have done something better. Maybe I, I could do something better for the next time. Maybe, like, maybe it's just okay, but I'm just feeling pain and I want to share. First of all, this, this, this thing helps. And then just communicating with myself and realizing, like, even, let's say, the most extreme scenario, let's say I lost 10% of my bank or something, uh, which maybe happened once. Um, I would just say like, it's okay. I knew what I'm getting into. And I probably thought the spot is really good and it was worth the risk. Uh, and I'm going to have to like, I'm, I'm just going to look back at some milestones. Like, I'm just going to say like, um, it, it's, it's actually something that I'm probably not doing enough uh, as a person in general, but like, um, like realizing how far I've come. Uh, but then at those, at those moments, I think it can be really useful. Just realizing like, listen, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm at a very good place. Like, uh, yeah, just, just give myself some, uh, some boost, like some, some good points that I've done, uh, some things that I'm achieved that I've just, I've achieved and, and, uh, that I'm in a good place in life whether uh, I lost this money today or not. And just that, uh, yeah, starting to, uh, the pain is going to be in there. I don't know. It's not really like I can uh, say these things and then it's just going to disappear. I kind of feel like after a good night's sleep, I just wake up much better the next day. Um, that's usually uh, the best thing I can get. Um, so I, I, I used to like taking walks when it happened. Um, I would just go around, play music. Uh, for me, I, I really like music. Music is really motivating and, and uh, good for me in different moods. Um, so I would just put my headphones, go for like a one, one hour of, of just walking around, uh, letting my thoughts just go through my head and breathing some air, uh, just going outside of the house. And then, yeah, I don't know, just do regular stuff. Just watch TV, just let the time go by or just go to sleep, depends on what the time is. And... I feel like it, it probably used to be sometimes painful even one day after that. But nowadays I, nowadays, I feel like it's kind of over at that point. After I wake up, it's just another day. And yeah, we keep going. I love it. I love as well that there was no rush to get rid of the pain. I think this is the mistake people often make. They almost like want the pain to end straight away. For you, you were first of all being with it. And it's like, right, this hurts. Ah, this sucks. That's stop what I'm doing is be with the pain. Then you went through like a process of reframing it, uh, speaking with other people, getting sort of some cognitive understanding of what actually happens. And then also you mentioned like being grateful for your situation, looking back on the milestones you've taken. So all these things are helping you to uh, process the, the motion, feel it, but at the same time, the pain's still there for a period of time. So yeah, I think there's understand that not trying to rush through this process, allowing it to unfold naturally, doing the right things that allow you to uh, deal with it. And yeah, knowing that, Pain plus reflection equals growth, almost always. If you can learn to be with painful emotions, painful situations, generally you're growing through that period. So for you, uh, you've obviously, obviously built the skill over time, so you tolerate it better and better. Your kind of refractory period of coming back around from a, a painful period to feel okay again, it's probably less than a day now. Maybe in the past it was a lot longer, which is, yeah, really, really good. So yeah, super, super powerful. And I think those, those skills that you learned there are really useful for the listener as well. Rene, for yourself, how do you deal with the pain of being a poker player? Well, that has been a uh, evolution throughout uh, my career. I think uh, I think actually we touched on this uh, a couple times throughout various podcasts. One podcast specifically stands out for me for the maybe new listeners. I think it was a second podcast that we did with Benabet Beat. He he talked a lot about the the sitting with the emotions. I remember really really pointed out, and I actually went through a similar process where I started to realize also through work with therapy. And to becoming more reflective and self-aware of the behavior, like, oh, every time when I lose or every time when I make a mistake, I feel bad about myself. 
and I don't want to feel bad about myself. So what I do immediately, I go full in the grind. I go, I do everything to remove that feeling. I do everything besides feeling the feeling. All right. Other people <laughs> might do worse habits, you know, they might get drunk or something like that. At least I will got productive with it. It sort of motivated me to work on my game or to analyze the whole spot to make sure I needed like some sort of um, some sort of an outcome. Either I played the hand badly and I learned something from it, or I came to the conclusion: listen, you didn't do anything wrong. I just couldn't deal with the feeling of insecurity. And when I worked also with therapy, it's like, well, okay, you don't like to feel insecure about yourself, and you try to do all this behavior to make sure that doesn't happen, right? You become maybe perfectionistic, so you don't get this situation where you feel insecure. And basically, you design your whole life just not to feel that feeling. Whereas the way easier solution is. Just feel the feeling and be okay with it. And that's something that I really highlighted that you mentioned many times. It's okay. I feel like it gets way worse as a poker player when you're like, I think you even mentioned, oh, I get cooled and I shout a couple of words. Maybe some people are listening like, oh no, when when I get cooled, I should just not respond because that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's going to be quite hard, right? If your expectation is, yeah, okay, I should just be this Zen master while playing or I should not show my emotions and then the emotions do come up. Yeah, and then you may be, you're only making it worse. Whereas if you just accept the fact that you're human and everyone responds to these emotions in a different way, um, yeah, you have to you have to just accept that. And I've also highlighted the word empathy. I think this is also actually a trend that comes comes along quite often through throughout our podcast. I think that's kind of when you mature, you start to notice that empathy is actually a very good way out of these kind of situations. So yeah, I mean, I deal with my uh, fair share of pain. Here and there, a fair share of uh, bad emotions. Uh, I think uh, another point that I wrote down as well, yeah, when when something triggers you, it's trying to tell you something, right? I usually, especially like to reflect on things where I feel like I respond overly emotional, right? If someone punches you in the face, it's okay to be, to be angry, but to which degree? You understand? Are you going to... Are you going to look him up, hunt him down and uh, and destroy his whole family? That seems a little bit overreactive if you ask yeah. me. So you understand? So... Of course, to a certain degree, you can you can react. But if you react over emotionally to a situ- situation, there's probably something to learn about yourself, right? And try to dig a bit me, uh, try to dig a bit deeper. Like, oh, this is not only emotion that I'm letting out from this event. This is apparently accumulated emotion, something that's even deeper. And I think definitely working uh, with a therapist and trying to resolve that, I think, uh, I think will help you a lot. With because obviously, if a trigger triggers not only the emotions of this moment but also emotions of the past it can be very overwhelming and harder to deal with so then we have to resolve the underlying emotions but definitely emotions like a compass it shows you where you can make progress as a human and then automatically also as uh as a poker player of course um i wanted to go quickly jump into your transition from entities to cash games i was curious what kind of strategic adjustments did you have to make when switching from entities to cash do you remember a couple of things that we were like struggling with like oh this is a, this is a bit different yeah um first of all i think um covid here was a really good uh was a really good preparation for the for the switch because basically until covid i was basically kind of like a street player i would play kind of freestyle of course, I knew like ranges and and stuff, and maybe maybe was introduced to to solver outputs a few times, but uh, um, not not much uh, work down in this uh, direction. At least not like uh, technically. Maybe like manually, just talking about a hand and analyzing the theory this way. Um, and then during COVID, I thought like, okay, I'm playing online again, so I need to probably um and i'm playing higher now i, I should probably uh, get like a coach or something and I, and I got like some coachings for uh for theory stuff and and improved a lot in that direction started working with solvers basically um and then when i was uh, switching to cash games i was already somewhat uh somewhat good with with theory and and solvers and i think uh when I met when I made the switch, of course, first of all, it's like you're playing a completely different game. It's basically uh, different ranges, uh, different environment. Uh, everything is different, and at first, it's like it's really tough um, because you you kind of have to switch your like 
metagame beliefs. Um, some things works for you really well in in one game, and then in the other format, it's it's gonna uh, just be dust. You're just gonna be giving away money, um, and the other way around. And yeah, I think I think I was just in a really good environment, um, and and still am in a really good environment of people who just uh, study and play the game consistently and are really aware of like the, the theory concepts and and the exploits you have to go through um, in order to to win at your game and to try and do basically to to get the highest EV uh, possible. I remember um, there was like, I'm not even sure about the screen names and I just don't want to say, uh, even if, if I, even if I did that, I'm just I'm not gonna say the screen name. But there was like this one guy, a couple of years ago, who maybe even got banned. I'm not sure. Uh, he was like 99% uh, using real time assistance, uh, and everybody knew it basically. And me and uh, Dudi, who is uh, a friend of me, uh, we basically throughout the year we had a 2x more win rate than him. So he was play basically playing a perfect strategy. But we 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 were winning. Uh, uh, I think he was winning like four BB hundred, and we we had like a, an eight BB win rate uh, over like twenty twenty one or something. And I I think this comes from like a lot of adjustments and work you have to do that doesn't involve theory. Um, so that's that's always really nice to see because some people say ah oh, like if there is like an RTA the games are dead or like if there is like uh, the solvers got to a certain amount where you can now just uh, you you can solve any spot with AI in two seconds. Then what's the point? It's solved. No, it's not solved. You can just do so many things, and even if one is gonna watch uh, the the games that are going on like right now, like the three four hundred games uh, of the best guys, you're gonna see that as well. Like there are many gonna, there are gonna be many hands where people uh, don't play the the perfect strategy, and of course some of it is just gonna be a mistake, but some of it is just going to be uh, with uh, reason behind it. So, yeah, I think there is. this is one of my best parts about the game, why I love it so much, because it's not solved. There is so many things you can do. Um, and Like, every day you learn something new, you try something new. It's, it's pretty cool. You already mentioned a bit earlier uh, about the jump between, I think, 5.10 to 10.20. Which jump in stakes for you was the hardest? Was that the jump from to, to, to play against 5k? Um, so in cash games, I think everything went pretty smoothly. Um, I've had some struggles going f from 5, 10, 10, 20 to, to 25, 50. I did have those struggles. Um, but um, I would say it's, it was probably the hardest because above that it was already all pretty similar and everything was going pretty smooth. Um, but if I had to guess, I, I would assume it was somewhere around the MTT world, actually. Um, it's going from playing like, I don't know, um, mid stakes to high stakes MTTs and then like playing uh, live high stakes MTTs to nosebleed high stakes MTTs. There would be, I think those are really tough um, because there you actually have such a such a small edge, and the variance can be so crucial. Um, and yeah, I I like to take big shots, like I said, so this can be really really painful at times um, if things are not going well. Uh, so yeah, I think. This is probably the, the hardest one in MTTs and in cash games. It, it was probably moving up to 5k because above that, again, I feel like maybe there is a certain difference to playing 20k, 40k games, uh, like 20k, 40k or like 5k, 10k. But in general, it's, it's somewhat similar, I think. Or like, it's not, it's not as hard as moving from 510 to 2550. It's less, at least that's how I approach it. Um, what was it about like the way the opponents or the, the the other regulars at the games then play at the higher stakes that makes them harder to play against? Um, so first of all, I think uh, I think they are just gonna be much more 
uh, stronger uh, just about their like theory. They are just going to be a lot more uh, accurate. And then they are also going to pay attention a lot more to what you're doing and how they can uh, basically backfire it into your face. And yeah, I think this is the, probably the main part, I would say. Uh, just, yeah, being uh, really, really accurate theoretically and, and just being able to, to do the adjustments needed to, to take you down. Yeah, I, w I would say I experienced the same. Basically, the more you go up the stakes, the less leaks players have. So the more you're kind of, you don't really see anymore where the EV is made. It's like, yeah, well, I cannot really attack here. I cannot really attack there. And then you kind of revert to a more defensive type of strategy, which feels a bit more that you're just handed into the poker gods who's going to win or not. So yeah, it, it just makes it, it just makes people way harder to, to, to play against. And indeed, obviously also the pools are smaller, so they pay way more attention to you as a specific player. So uh, yeah, you have to think way deeper in terms of, okay, not only how do I play against you, but how would this player play against me? So it's also way more important when you play smaller pools, higher stakes that you are reflective in terms of your own strategy. You're like, okay, what are leagues that I have and how I would go about exploiting myself in a way. So you can also see like, okay, if I would be playing against myself, I would do this. And then you could maybe start to spot, hey, other players are doing that. So he's probably trying to exploit me on this tendency that I have. I don't want to necessarily say leak. It can also just be a strategical uh, strategical reference. Throughout, throughout your career, maybe when trying to move up to the stakes, what have been like some of the bigger aha moments or like strategical breakthroughs so you could actually uh, yeah, move up? Um. I would say it was probably, um, I don't know if it was uh, strategical, more as if it was like kind of a mental thing, just realizing that, okay, like I remember moving up to like 5,100 for the first time and I had enough money to play it pretty comfortably. But I said like, wow, this is like 5,100. Like this is pretty sick. Uh, but then I sit down, the lineup is the same lineup as 2550. I was already doing well. And I say, okay, I'll just play the game and then move up to 100, 200. And then, oh, this is actually a, a bit of a tougher lineup. And then I would play the game and I would just be like, okay, this is actually tougher, but I can do it. Like, it's just like, I, I see some people uh, moving up the stakes and then they just feel like oh everyone is so much better now everybody's gonna crush me uh i i, I can't play with these guys uh, blah 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 and i think this is like the main point just realizing you are again playing human beings they are probably more experienced uh than you um and they are probably uh a bit stronger than the players you were playing at the lower stakes but you're still playing human beings that you can beat um it's not like you're now playing five robots and you're just gonna sit there and lose uh, your 10 to 20 bb 100 and and that's it there's no nothing you can do about it and i actually see like people moving and i probably experienced it myself at some point that uh yeah you just you just have to again uh like you're going to see a certain thing. Let's say you had a spot where like you thought, oh, this is like a snap fault on the river or like, oh, this is a really terrible bluffing spot on the river. And then they, you would see someone moving up and you would say, ah, in, in 20K, I have to call this on the river. No, but the spot is really bad. Why would you call? Or like this, this is a really bad bluff. Now, ah, but now I'm at the bottom of my range. So I need to do this. So I need to do that. And, and I think they, they, uh, they feel like they need to now play special or like play, uh, I don't know, um, reinvent the game or whatever it is, uh, because now they are moving up, especially if it's like to, uh, to actually like high stakes. And it's not, you just need to play solid. You need to have a solid game plan. And of course, if people are playing different than in, in 25, 50, then 10, 20, of course, you're going to realize that and you're going to make the adjustments. But at first, you're just going to sit there play your solid game plan and try to adjust. 
uh, within time, see, see how things go. Um, and I think that's the biggest moment. That's the biggest thing I think about uh, this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's basically the same. Uh, probably uh, popular listeners to the podcast be like, hey, I've heard this before because this has been a red line throughout many guests in Vietnam. Uh, and it's it's so weird. Like the reason why you were able to move up is because you were ha you had, for example, a very solid approach, very solid strategy. Then why do we feel the need to change it when you go a level up? It makes no sense. The way you played, you earned your place at the higher stakes. So why change it? What for you have been some of the most effective ways to improve your game? Um, so I'm actually not the average, uh, high stakes guy in a matter of studying. I don't enjoy just studying. Um, there are phases in my career where I studied a lot. There are still going to be some of those spaces, but, uh, I would say in my routine, I probably study a few hours a week. But I do just uh, share and look at a lot of Andy stories every day, uh, just from friends. And then this is most of my study these days. I just pick up on cons on theory concepts pretty fast and have like a solid game plan in general. And then I just try to yeah share and 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 view as many hands as possible. And get really good uh, info from people who play the same games. And uh, that way, basically, it's it's basically like studying. It's basically like doing a lot of handy story reviews, uh, but it's just, yeah, one hand at a time. Yeah, I think if you, especially obviously, if you have, if you have good, good inputs around you, right? From very, from very good players, this, uh, this is going to be very effective. Also, I assume, that you pay a lot of attention to, for example, other very studied players. I remember, for example, in the, uh, uh, when I was at the peak of my career, I wasn't actually, like, it sounded a bit similar. Obviously, I was aware of a lot of theoretical concepts, but it's not like I was spending a lot of time in the solver. I was mis just mainly talking strategy with fellow, fellow poker players sharing hands. But since everyone was in the solver streets and I was playing against a lot of guys on the solver streets, you would see them every time making certain moves and be like, ah, that actually makes a lot of sense. And they maybe got it from the solver. So indirectly, I was also doing a lot of solver work, but I was processing it a bit different. I would see a strategy and be like, hmm, ah, okay, this is quite interesting. I can see what, what this sizing or what this hand is trying to accomplish. And I understand the concept behind it. Like, hey, okay, let me let me add this now into my own game. And then would actually sometimes see the same person who I then got that concept from, or at least he was starting to apply it into his game. I then saw him misapplying it. Basically, he just got it from the from the solver and just started copying it. It was like, wait, wait. But I understood that it put me in an annoying spot in this situation. But what you're doing now, this makes no sense. You are just now copying what the solver told you to do. But I feel like you're kind of misunderstanding the concept behind it. So often by experiencing, and I think this is also the value of playing against uh, tough opponents, they will put you in tough spots. And you'll be like, hmm, this is actually quite an annoying situation. And you can then learn from it. Like, okay, how did... How did he build a strategy that now put me in a tough situation? And you can then try to learn from it. So basically, I would almost say playing against very good players and paying attention to them and trying to learn from them is, is like a step beyond consulting the solvers. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. And yeah, everything you said makes perfect sense. I'm uh, very curious. You already mentioned, especially I think during the Imagine Games, you were you had very solid routines. I'm curious, like what does a day to day or week to week in the life of uh, barrack grinding look like? So it changes a lot, like really a lot. Um, there would be certain times that I wake up uh, very early in the morning, like six to probably not six. Six was uh, very extreme. But let's say in general, like 7 to 10 a.m. or something. Um, and just wake up like, for example, the last routine before uh, my live experiences recently was basically waking up um, pretty early. Just uh, it's basically, uh, you. I don't know if you guys heard of uh, Uberman. It's basically the Uberman morning routine of just waking up uh, immediately going out to the sun for like uh, a walk. So 
So I would just take, uh, I don't really do a lot of workouts. So I just, I, I was walking around a lot and the weather was pretty great at uh, spring. So I was uh, just walking around for like an hour or like 90 minutes and then getting back, getting like cold shower and then like only then get like uh, something to eat. Um, then basically what happens is if it's time to play that I, uh, if like I have no other commitments or something that I've uh, scheduled to do this day, then I would just open the computer, uh, see, open the lobbies, see if there are any games running. And if I feel like it, I will play. Uh, if I still feel like it, I can like open sit and I don't know, do something until uh, something shows up. Uh, but life is pretty chill. I'm not really grinding like big time or anything like it. Um, I think my average this year uh, at home is like four hours a day or something, which is uh, for me, it's at least for me, it's not a lot. Um, so yeah, just chilling with friends, uh, like ordering food, going to some restaurants, uh, doing all this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, like studying here and there, like, again, like not super often, um, maybe, maybe really like a few hours a week, like three to four hours, something like that. And yeah, there is nothing really, uh, special going on just like that. That's basically it. Um, and then there would be times where like I wake up super late because I'm playing MTTs for now, like, like today, for example, um, where the, there is a series going on on GG and I decided I'm going to put like three to four sessions a week. Um, and then I go to sleep super late. I wake up super late, um, and basically do similar things, but just much later trying to enjoy the, the end of the summer, going to the beach a lot. Uh, again, just uh, chilling with friends, watching some TV, nothing too special. Before you play, do you have any uh, specific rituals you go to, like a pre-session routine, or it's just, oh, the games are on now, I, I dive in, or do you at least take some time to think about, okay, uh, what, what, are, what, what I have to focus on? So it's, it's kind of funny because during the... For me, it's, it's kind of uh, extreme doing the Imagine King games uh, in Israel uh, time zone every day around like 6 a.m. or like 5.30 a.m. He would play his first uh, session. And basically what I did is I would go to sleep very early, like maximum at like 1 a.m., and which is really unlike me. Um, but even sometimes at like 11 to 12, would we'll just go to bed and instantly fall asleep because I was waking up very early. And then I would just uh, wake up like 6 a.m., uh, open my phone, open the GG app. If, if he's sitting in there, uh, usually this is the time where the table wasn't even full because everybody's sleeping. And I would just instantly sit in. Uh, you can sit out for like seven minutes until they uh, remove you. So I was just brushing my teeth, washing my face, going to my desk, uh, switching to my uh, computer app and start playing. And I think it happened a lot. Some people, it would be disastrous for them. For me, it's just natural. I don't know. I can just do it. I can do the switch uh, very quickly. Um, so in general, I'm not the kind of guy who has like a warm up or like a ritual or anything like that. Uh, but I've seen that like, for example, before a day of playing, like I think like life is different for me. Because online, I just sit next to my desk. I'm so used to it and it's so comfortable. And there is no pressure for me because, I don't know, it's just my normal thing. But then when I go play live, I feel like it's so much different. You just sit there, play one end at a time, uh, like 20, 25 ends uh, an hour. And uh, it's super long and, and in, it's, 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 uh, it's much more stressful. Um, like when you're going all in for like, uh, 20k live or online completely different from some for some reason maybe it's also a matter of experience or something but at least that's how i experience it um and then uh when playing live i would definitely have a much healthier ritual or like uh routine 
And for playing online, I'm definitely trying to do more healthy things just for my lifestyle. But I don't feel like it has like a huge effect on my game. It probably still has an effect on, on my game. Uh, but I, I don't feel like it's, at, it's as big as it is maybe for different people. Um, uh, but yeah, that's just, that's just how I approach it. Yeah, for example, if I talk about myself, let's say I'm aware of certain uh, certain leaks that I have, or certain tendencies that I want to get rid of. If I just sit down, start play, nine out of ten times, yeah, I will just sit down and be my myself, which includes the leaks, right, that I actually want to fix. So for myself personally, before I, I start, I definitely have to reinforce like, okay, these are things that I would like to change so that when the moment comes up, I can recognize that my default state wants to wants to do the thing that it always does, which I identified as probably suboptimal. So then at least before I play, I will have certain hand marks, for example, that show, hey, this is the preferably the concept in action, how I would like to do it. But, you know, especially if it's a leak, I can find a lot of examples of where I'm doing it wrong. So usually in the beginning, it's wrong. And then as soon as I did it a couple of times right, I'll replace the wrong for right. I think that just works a little bit, a bit better, like to reinforce what you want to do more of instead of to remind yourself of what you don't want to do. I find that a bit more, a bit more effective. And then just write out for myself, okay, this is what I'm going to focus on. And then I notice when the spots come up, first of all, I notice I'm just more focused. Like I'm looking for these situations where I can improve. And then when they do come up, I'm like, ah, yes, naturally, intuitively, I want to do this, but my intuition is clearly biased towards the leak here. So I definitely notice for myself that if I don't sit down and kind of refocus, then I'll go in autopilot. And if the autopilot then Depends how good your autopilot. Apparently, your game is uh, your autopilot game is very solid. That you can just wake up and and play and play good straight away. But I think again, I think that's also something that we touch out throughout this conversation. Everyone is different, and you have to kind of find out what works for you. You also mentioned, I think, earlier as well, when going from online to live, that you need some time to adjust. I think you said like uh, two weeks to adjust to live, and you also mentioned that you find live actually more stressful, even though it's only twenty five hands an hour. Uh, what are kind of the adjustments you have to make when going from online to live play so most of the time going from online to live means um that you're gonna play uh, a much softer field and a different kind of field so basically what happens is Again, like all your kind of like beliefs and, and meta game that you've been practicing for the last one, two, three months or whatever since the last live stop you've had um, are not valid anymore. Like some of them, of course, are gonna uh, still be valid, but you're gonna have to make some differences. You're gonna have to adjust again. And for me, also another thing is just performance. Uh, so if I sit down and play live for three months, like I just did, uh, I feel like in, if you take the performance I had doing like the, the gap of like 30, like day 30 to day 60 out of those 90 days, it, it was probably at, at its peak, both like, uh, mentally, physically, uh, and like just strategy wise. And if you look like at the, the, the first, uh, I don't know, two weeks or something, or like maybe the even the last week where I was already exhausted. Um, I think uh, there is a there is like maybe like a 10 BB 100 win rate difference between those two guys. And for me, uh, yeah, I, I guess that the, the adjustments are just yeah pay, paying much more attention to every hand going on at the table. Um, which as in online you don't have to do that because oh, you, there, there was a big pot and you just pay attention on the river, you just click the replay button, you can just see what happened and take your note or whatever, or like so, see if the recreation are just is now tilted or whatever. And live, you just miss the hand, you have no idea what's going on anymore. And I often see that like playing live, I would play a table. I'm still definitely far from being 100% focused and paying attention to every hand because that's just impossible. Um, but I would often see that like another regular is playing uh, uh, recreational in a very bad way. And he's, that just means one of two things. One is he hasn't been paying attention, or two, he has been paying attention, but he's not making the right adjustments. So for me, I feel like whenever I'm going from online to live, it takes me like uh, one to two weeks. 
And one of the things that a friend suggested and I, I kind of like doing is the, I don't always do it, but um, I think it's very good to do it once in a while that like you just finish the live stop and, and you have like everything is fresh in your mind. Just take a notebook and write down like all of the things you could have done better, whether it's on, on, on the felt or off the felt. And then like whenever you're going to uh, go for a live play again, you're going to do that. You're just going to look at that. And, or like, let's say in the beginning, you feel like in the first uh, one to two weeks, you're, you're having some leaks that show up. You, you punt too much or you, I don't know, you miss, uh, calculate the pot or I don't know anything you, you, you feel like you're, you're struggling with. You just write it down. And then all of those things before the next stop, they are going to be so, so much, uh, so helpful for you. Um, even if you don't do anything about, about it, just read for 10 minutes, what you wrote down, it's going to be, uh, uh, so good for you. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I guess that's one thing. And, and the same thing goes to online. You just go back and you haven't done any theory work for, for a while, even if it's only like two weeks, it, it matters because you, I like to call you play like, uh, online is like real poker and live is like not really real poker a lot of the time. Um, at least not, uh, uh, like below like 10k or something um and yeah then you just have to for me this was the most uh the most important stuff yeah so basically when you're saying that if i understood correctly it's for example the things you take in consideration when making a decision if you play three four handed against kevin linus it's obviously going to be way different than if you're in vegas playing as a guy with a cowboy hat that's kind of what you're saying right we don't have to consider yeah. about, yes, this hand, I should probably check back, you know, balance my range here and there. Yeah, we're playing against a guy with a cowboy head in Vegas. Maybe you should just play your hand in a vacuum. That's kind of what you're saying. Yeah. And then let's say you're paying 100% att attention to Linus and Kevin playing. First of all, I've already played like hundreds of thousands of hands with them. Um, and I have an idea of how they're playing. And even if I don't, I can just off the table, just open my poker tracker and, and go over hands and see what happened. Whereas if you're now playing the, the guy with a, cow, with, a, with a cowboy and you're likely to only play him once in your lifetime, um, and he has made a certain play that can change your strategy in a hand you're going to have against him, I, I really believe that it can change a decision. Let's say like the guy jams 40 BB on the river all in. And you now face a decision with a bluff catcher and you're sitting there and you're thinking mm, like, okay, like what does Fury say? Let's say Fury says this is a free big blind call, uh, but, but the guy is the guy with a cowboy hat. What, what is he up to? And then like, other than him being with a cowboy hat, you know, nothing. Then you, maybe you can, if you're a very experienced life player, maybe there could be like live tales or anything. But if there isn't anything like that, you're just sitting there and trying to think about uh, the meta of the spot or whatever, but now you're just playing live with a guy and you have no idea how he's playing. So if it's the first hand that he's playing on the table, then you are unlucky. But if it's, uh, if it's, if he's already been playing for two or three or eight hours and you haven't been paying attention, whereas another guy has been paying attention, maybe you make the call down and lose 40 BB. Uh, and, and the other guy makes the, uh, the fold and, and, you basically just saved uh, 40 BB. Um, or like another example, like you, you make the fold and he shows the bluff where, and another guy makes the call. It's basically a 40 BB difference. And it can even be bigger when it's uh, more deep stack. So I really believe in that approach. Like obviously in most scenarios in poker, like you can't really say, ah, oh, it's like zero or a hundred. The EV is going to be somewhere in between, right? Um, but I really believe that, especially live playing certain guys, you can say like, okay, there is 99%. This guy has the nuts. Mm -hmm. So I just have to fold the third nuts because there is not much I can do here. Um, yeah, also, then you, because, you... also because the way they approach the game, like you said, there, there are two different games. The way they approach the game is also so different than online where it's going to be less extreme usually because, you know, people might, I don't know, random, oh, they don't want to do it, but you know, they will do it 20% of the time in life. It's just yeah. like the way that people also construct their ranges, it's very, yeah, will very much lead them towards always 
having something and never having the other where online, you know, things are more randomized. So the, the EV difference is going to be less big. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And also like, uh, one year, like, let's say you are a recre recre even a recreational player and you're sitting there online playing a few tables and you now lost a huge hand. Then, yeah, you're probably likely to get tilted. And, and now I would look out for, for this guy and, and probably be ready for him to, to be more likely to spew. But then if it's live and he just lost a big pot, then that makes a huge difference. Yeah. And if you don't pay attention, then yeah. Like I, I, I Again, like I'm far from perfect. I, I can sit there, obviously, and then look at the, you know, I, I would uh, get a hand. I would look at it, just drop my phone down because I was uh, sending a message or something. And then I would uh, look at the hand, open it, and then this recreational would flat. And then I would say, ah, how does he have only like one third of a starting stack? What happened? I mean, these things happen. It's okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's again, like you, you need to acknowledge that you're not going to be focused 100% of the time. And that's fine. Yeah, but so just... your but, but your attention should be at least listen. Try to at least pay some attention so we can get some information about how these players are playing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. I, for example, actually this this summer I was actually in uh, in Vegas. Actually, we 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 saw each other there as well. This was the first time I played live in probably ten years or so, or at least first time that I went to Vegas in ten years. And I was actually very surprised with how regulars how little people were paying attention at the table. I'm also more like, listen, when I play live, I'm going to try to pay attention because any showdown can tell me a lot about how, especially like I said, people live don't randomize shit. It's not like they randomly, oh yeah, he would do it 80% of the time, but 20% of the time he checks and he's not bluffing that hand or, you know, he's always bluffing that hand or even like in spots where people should usually never bet and now suddenly have a betting range. Okay, so you have betting ranges in these type of spots. What does that say about your checking range next time? Well, okay, next time when you check here, I'm going to pound quite a lot of pressure, for example. These kind of things, you have to pay attention. I remember actually there was one hand where three fishes sat down. Oh, no, two fishes sat down and one of the fish stood up and was basically coaching the other two fishes. It was quite an interesting dynamic. And then there was <laughs> one wreck, who I know is a live wreck. He was sitting there, sunglasses, headphones, but these guys, you know, they came in, they were chatty. And due to the chatter, you could notice, okay, this guy on my right, he was play, pretending, but he, he was just looking to get his stack in at some point, right? He was not going to play there for an hour and just grind. Then at some point, the guy, the guy opens. He has been a bit on the tighter side, but to be fair, he was just, it, it was about, it was going to happen. I'm, and I play no life, no life. And I could feel at some point it's going to happen. So the guy triples off in position on a board that has two sixes on it. And the live wreck, he actually had a six and he went to the tank on the river. And he ended up, in my opinion, slow rolling the fish quite hard because the fish just had nothing. Uh, and then afterwards also someone said, yeah, he didn't listen to what was going on because he was with his headphones on. I was like, but that's a huge mistake. Like these guys sit down, you have to kind of, you know, chat with them and kind of feel the vibe at the table. And for that, you cannot wear headphones, in my opinion. But still, when I saw majority of people are with music in and like you miss so much information that could yeah that that could alter the way you would play your hand i was just also in general surprised with how much information was giving away at the table even though i'm not experienced but especially with timing and stuff it's like all the regulars were just snap this snap that and then when they would think then it, it would say so because every time they step check it's like okay well no more nuts in your range that was kind of every time every time what, what would happen i was actually very surprised about uh about live poker but yeah it's like you said it's a completely completely different game completely different yeah game. so what, yeah, so what do you I... see for example if you you play a lot of life and you see for example a person like myself an online kid coming to life what what is like classic mistakes that these online players make when they come play live um i would i would assume there are gonna be some uh, physical mistakes um, I'm probably not the kind of guy to um, to give the input on that just because I'm not super experienced uh, myself. Um, I'm somewhat aware and I'm doing some work about that uh, part of the game, but definitely far from like the best guys. Um, I, I guess it's just like a game plan, basically. You just need to have a completely different game plan. Um, I don't want to dive too much in, in, into the strategy of uh, how and, and, and why and whatever, but the, the game is, like I said, it's just so much different. Um, you just really need to have like uh, 
you, you, you need to figure out where you are, what you're trying to achieve, like on day one, on day two. You just pay attention to what people are doing. Or like you're playing a live cash game, then what is the meta? How is it different? How is the stack, type, uh, stack size different? Okay, like you just need to sit there, play solid and pay attention for a few days. If it's the first time you, you get there and then you, again, like if you pay enough attention, you, you start uh, realizing what you can do. Um, and I think whenever I see people who do that, they can be much worse players than other really good online players, but they are going to have really good results. And I can see really good online players coming and just spewing around because they have no clue of what's going on. And, I, and that's, that's definitely something that I've seen uh, going on. Yeah, especially um, because because there's way more spots where people either always have it and not, not and they'd never have it, for example. So the EV, like you said, of a decision that you make is going to be way greater. Whereas the online kid will have less experience and he would probably project the, uh, his own range onto his opponent to a certain degree. But like, yeah. I, I, for example, I was aware of these things before I, before I went in. I, I went to play live for like two weeks. I was like, well, I never play live, so certain things are going to happen. I already agreed, okay, there's got to be a couple of moments where I just throw in the wrong fucking chip. Obviously, it happened a couple of times where I was suddenly, what I called, but I wanted to three bet, you know, or like a completely miscalculated size of the pot. These are things, you know, that, that, that are going to happen, but especially trying to not project uh yeah your knowledge onto your opponent that was definitely a big one that i had top of mind like this game is this, this is this is different poker like you said yeah yeah and, and like another thing that comes to mind is about what you said uh, about listening and i remember an extreme thing that some guy at my table like rich guy with like probably like a 500k dollar uh, watch uh like uh, he has like jewelry he looks like extremely rich and he looks like he doesn't give any fuck about what's going on. And he basically was talking to his friend on the phone and, and was telling him he's going to dinner with him at 7 p.m. And the day ends at like 12 or something. So, like, this tells you that if he still has a stack by 6.30, <laughs> I mean... If he's going to give like it away, huge, yeah. If it's not like a huge stack, maybe then it changes his plan, but he's probably going to give it away. And, and I think he gave it away much earlier, but... Um, yeah, like you can pick up on extreme things. I actually, I really enjoy uh, listening to music while playing. It really gets me uh, into a really good uh, uh, mindset, I think. So I probably miss a bunch of stuff, but I do pay attention to showdowns. And like you said, if there's like a big conversation going on or if there are like fun people, I would often just uh, socialize and see uh, what's going on. Yeah, yeah, not or, only at least, because or at least reads. take out one earpiece so you could kind of yeah. the better both worlds. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, uh, it's also a part of the fun of the game, the socializing with new people. It's listen, not only that, that was also only... the reason I was there. Like, if I want to listen to music while playing, I I will stay here behind my computer, <laughs> right? I'm here in Vegas. Yeah. I want to have I want to have fun. I want to chat with uh, cow, cow, Cowboy Bill next to me. You know. <laughs> yeah. Hi guys, Rene aka The Wacko here with a quick Mechanics of Poker 2.0 announcement because we are currently open to receive 10 new players in our Mechanics of Poker coaching program. In our program you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player. Now one of these of course is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. Our mindset and performance coach Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt and play your A game more consistently. And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, 
and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? And will you take one of the 10 available seats? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com and apply for the program. And maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. Uh, you, you also have a lot of experience coaching. In your experience working with, with players while coaching them, what are some common leaks that you constantly see and how do you go about fixing them? I wouldn't say I have a lot of experience coaching. I have some exp experience. Um, I would definitely say uh, one of the big things I see is, uh, I'm not sure it's a leak, but it's just a thing that people, they talk about the game in one way, but then in practice they play differently. There seems to be like a big performance gap between their knowledge and their ability to uh, perform. Um, and I would say it probably comes from a bunch of mental stuff, uh, but it's something that I, I consistently see and it's it's very interesting to dive into this and, and how you can change it. Because I would imagine uh, the things that affect it is just like uh, stress, uh, it's uh, how you deal with losing hands or like the session began pretty bad or like you got the worst river in the deck, like all this kind of stuff or like you made a mistake or like how you deal with time banks. Like some people, uh, myself included, the more time I have, the more I would feel relaxed, even if I need three seconds to make a, a decision at some uh, in some spots, I would still uh, feel a lot more comfortable to do it when I have like a 200 seconds time bank or like no time bank in live, rather than having like the 30 second shot clock or whatever. Um, so that's another thing. Um, or like people who play too many tables, all this kind of stuff, just it's not really like strategy leaks, but just like, I guess, mental and, and, uh, and uh, management leaks uh, that I see often. And I'm not 100% sure how to deal with them. I, I guess, again, it's just like a matter of like trying to realize for each person where, where they come from, where these gaps come from and, and what you can do about it. All right. Then I actually, I wanted to touch on uh, the, the projection and the performance aspect that you said. I wish we... I wish we would know someone who's very good at uh, performance, mental game mindset. Oh, there he is, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Adam Carmichael. This is actually also one of the reasons why I teamed up with Adam um, in, in our own coaching program, because in my experience as well, but also my experience with coaching players, the performance aspect, the mental game aspect, like I always say, I can teach you, and you probably have the same experience. Our job as technical coaches is to explain people how to think about poker, how the game works. But then how much of that knowledge you can apply to the table and how much uh, access you have to that knowledge that really depends on like your mental game, your mindset, how certain things trigger you at the table, your ability to perform. And that's, I think, where Adam comes in. So Adam, what are, in your opinion, some common performance leaks and also tip for Varric? He said, I don't really know what how to handle with these type of students that have these kind of problems. What uh, What mm -hmm. should he advise them? Jump in the cold yeah, well, shower, I, I heard already, but mm -hmm. other than that. Yeah, well, I like the way uh, Barak described it. And he talked about this performance gap between the knowledge of the player and what they're able to, able to execute in game. So first of all, we're seeing that it's not so much a strategic, strategic errors. There's a gap between what they're executing in game. And then uh, also the factors that lead to that. So you mentioned stress, you mentioned emotion, you mentioned lack of focus. And I think like this is so hard to like give a kind of one could approach solution, but it's understanding that humans are very complex and we have certain things that cause triggers, responses, and for us to act suboptimally. So as you mentioned, stress is a big one. And probably the most important one is emotions, how we handle emotions, how we handle our interacting with our environments, what thoughts are coming up and what emotions are causing us to deviate strategies. We've also got cognitive biases which are coming in, which maybe get us to uh, deviate strategy. So uh, I think rather than coming up with a uh, one uh, solution for each player, it's understanding 
building awareness. So each citizen has a gap. So say Barry's got a, a student and he realizes this guy is amazing in theory, amazing away from the tables, but his results suck. All right, so we've got to keep, there's a gap between who, who this guy could be and what he's performing in game. Then we need to start, start detecting, okay, where are the errors coming from? And understand that a person, like his lifestyle, what, what he's doing, how he's dealing with stress is a good starting point, but also like how he's processing information, how he's dealing with triggers. So I think what we've covered so far in this conversation is actually a lot of the work that he needs to do. Kind of, if you watch the kind of start of this podcast and Barrack's um, kind of journey from a DGen to a kind of more uh, mentally calm, high stakes player, he's went through this process of building awareness around the triggers that cause responses that he's not happy with. And that's generally what's happening with a lot of these players. They're getting triggered by situations and then acting suboptimally. So it's building a kind of toolkit of awareness whilst you're playing. What are the main situations that cause you to be triggered? For a lot of players, it's making mistakes, it's losing, it's going on downswings, which leads to self-doubt, frustration, um, and things that cause big deviation in their strategy. So uh, trying to really understand the player and what they're struggling with, what they're suffering uh, through, and trying to give them a toolkit to deal with that. Because the long-term solution, in my opinion, is going through your part of career, building a, a more and more toolkits so that you can deal with more and more situations. So Barack, for example, like right now, he's got a, a whole host of toolkits to deal with adversity, to deal with challenges, to deal with emotions, because these things are needed. Because no matter how good you are at poker, the pain's going to come, as we've talked about today, and you're going to have challenges over and over. So I think it's identifying all those kind of factors that cause drops in performance. Another big one is focus, like how well players can focus. This can be down to energy levels, can be down to lifestyle factors, uh, but some players just don't pay them enough attention. Again, as Barracks talked about, the importance of being switched on for live, but also for online, you've got to... Uh, be there fully attentive during your sessions to uh, maximize your ability. So yeah, so much to unpack. I think it's the main thing is going down the avenue of exploration, building awareness, and then trying to come with toolkits to uh, to solve all those problems. What I'm really interested to know about you, Barack, uh, you mentioned something earlier, which I thought, which I highlighted a few times, playing these higher stakes games and almost like believing that you belong there. And your kind of frame of reference was, these guys are just human and I don't need to uh, fear them. I can hold my own against them or even try to exploit these. Now I can see like how that's an amazing mindset to have. What I want to know is how did you instill that mindset in yourself? How do you build that confidence that when you sit down with Linus, Kevin, other players who are really world-class players, some of the best in the world, how do you uh, keep that belief strong in tough environments, which are, you might not have the, the track record at that moment to back up your belief. So basically I think, uh... Like I said before, I'm very uh, aware of like results and obviously results can be uh, mistaken even in, even if there's like a, a certain sample size, I wouldn't say big sample size, but even like at uh, a medium amount of sample size, uh, they can definitely uh, not be correct uh, to what they would be if there were, if you were to play 1 million hands, for example. Um, but, uh, it's a mix of like having good results and like Rene said, just having a good feel, like you're feeling like you're in control. You're feeling like, uh, yeah, I, I got this. Like I, I, I see the spots where I'm making the money. Um, there are definitely spots where I'm losing money. Um, but overall, like, I feel like I'm, I'm doing well and, and, uh, my gameplay is solid for this game. And, uh, if you take that and the results into uh, accountability, then this leads me to uh, being able to play the game. Because obviously, even if I feel in control and whatever, and I'm going to just drop uh, two binds every day, at some point I will have to, to stop playing. Because uh, if just consistently I'm just going to lose 60 binds a month, then I will be out of money very quickly. Um, but if I keep playing and see that, like, over uh, like one, two, three years, I'm I'm making money. Even if in some of the toughest games, it's gonna be very little money, or like even slightly losing. Um, then then it's fine by me. Um, there is also an added EV of just like let's say you're playing like a break-even game, but uh, you're playing a really tough game. And even if you're not gonna analyze the hands and and only analyze like three or five hands every session, that's already a big win because those three or five hands are hands where you probably really, really struggled or like uh, you found out something really big because if you 
play those tough opponents, then they they get you into those nodes very often. Um, yeah, so that's basically how I see it. Yeah, so almost framing those real challenging games as learning opportunities, chances to grow, get better. What, in your opinion, is the most important skill for a poker, poker player to learn or a trade to acquire? Let's use this question relative to maybe a mid-stakes player who has aspirations of playing high stakes. Most important skill a player should have to learn. I think I would just state a few uh, general ones. We probably talked about all of them, but it's just like um, doing work on yourself, both mentally as a poker player and as a person, because I often feel like poker is really like life. Uh, there are many, many similarities. And I kind of feel myself growing in both aspects uh, simultaneously, which is kind of cool. Um, and there is, yeah, there is much to take from each one of, uh, like from life to poker and from poker to life, I really feel that way. Um, so there is that, there is uh, management, which means bankroll management, which means, uh, uh, game selection, which is really, really important. Um, the, it means who you're getting involved with. Um, so let's say you have a set of friends from poker who are like, they keep dragging you down, if you know what I mean. Like they, they keep just bringing uh, negative emotions. They keep, uh, yeah, they, they don't really add anything to your circle. They don't do anything good to you. Um, then maybe maybe it's not the best friendship for you. Um, I, I can tell, like, you, you really need a, like a good environment. Um, that's another thing. Um, what else? I guess just, Trying to be uh, consistent with uh, studying and not just paying attention to solvers, also paying attention to like metagame uh, or certain opponents or anything like that. Just really trying to uh, to build up your uh, skill set, not only around solvers, because those can take you only uh, so far. And yeah, I guess that's mostly what comes to mind. How does a player start to build a good environment of like-minded or even better players than themselves around them? It's always a common trait we see when we interview players that they generally at the high stakes have got a really good peer group of awesome players they're speaking with, but a lot of players might be listening might not have many players around who they can talk strategy with or progress with. So for yourself, how did you start to uh, acquire more high quality players in your peer group? What were some of the, the main things that were important for you? First of all, I feel like it's much beyond poker. It's just like, I believe there is some uh, luck to it. Just like, you know, when someone, uh, I don't know, he met uh, the love of his, of his life or someone met uh, the guy who brought him into this uh, startup company, which he sold for 1 billion or I don't know, like, because he was in the right place in the right time or he grew up in the right place or like anything like that. You can see so many examples of that. I guess it's just life variance, right? And then it's just also like a lot of time uh, people connect with each other, not because of poker. Like I, I, I can see like, let's say in Israel, we have like, I don't know, uh, a few different groups of uh, known regulars and everyone is friend with everyone, but there would be like those three, four, five guys who are really good friends. And then another uh, group of those and another group. And yeah, I, I am not really sure what connects between uh, all of those people, but it's just like you, you meet someone at a poker table or, or like online and then you meet him at a poker table. And then one day it either becomes friendship or not. And um, I guess, uh, for me, like it kind of happened uh, for both ways. They were like my closest uh, poker friends. They were also, they were really good people and pretty good poker players. And they were really helpful. Like I said, with mental stuff for me and management stuff and anything like that. They were good with strategy uh, stuff for me. They, it's, it's basically like, again, I, I, I can say I'm very lucky in that kind of uh, manner, but uh yeah, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that because it's just like, I feel like it just happened. Um, 
Yeah. So I don't know. It's, I feel like you definitely have control over people you don't want in your life. That's what I can tell you. And you have to realize like, okay, this guy is just, he's, he's a friend. I like him. He's a good guy, but he has like negative uh, impact on me. And he has like, uh, he brings nothing to the table. And I'm not saying you should be friends with people only if they do bring uh, something to the table. I'm just saying if someone is bad for you, then you should either like cut him loose or, uh, like, I don't know, give him like less attention or anything like that. And it's not always easy. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. There, there would be like certain uh, people I would just stay away from. Like I would meet someone at the poker table or uh, I, I don't know where. And he's also a poker player, but I would feel like, I don't know, he's a bit toxic. He's a bit uh, uh, bad influence. I don't know. And I would just, I would, I can like the guy and I can be his friend, but I would just not be his close friend. Um, yeah, he's not going to be my go-to guy on a day-to-day -day basis or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's the way I see it. Yeah, I think you have much more control of the people you don't let in compared to the people you let in. But I've also thought like all the people who reach the like, high stakes in particular all have really good people around them and they can't just all be getting lucky. Like all these luckily happen to get to the right people and it's just the kind of survival ship confirmation bias kind of thing going on. I think there's a lot of factors that go on. I think one is like attracts like and when you're on a kind of path and a really obsessive path to become the best at what you do you realize there's another kind of other underground people who are also on that path and you'll generally connect with them in some way some sort of laws of attraction universe that stuff going on but we generally like does attract like and you'll meet these people at a live stop or you'll chat them online or you'll have a coaching session with them and you'll just connect with them you just resonate really really high frequency because you guys are on the same path so i think that's a really big one Next one I think is really important is um, being valuable. Valuable people generally look for other valuable people. So if you become a valuable person, whether it's your skills with solvers, your skills of sharing knowledge, just you're generally trying to help other people, generally other valuable people attract themselves to you and you attract them. So there's some sort of synergy going on there where these people who, like yourself, who reach high stakes, have really good people around them. Obviously you've got good personality as well. There's, there's an element of us humans like people who we like, so to speak, which is hard to quantify. But yeah, I think there's a lot, some things that you're doing right that lead to that kind of trending towards i think from one of the other previous podcasts we talked trending towards happiness trending towards a good environment around you i think these factors matter and yeah hopefully those who are listening are in, in the process of building their own peer groups and it's one of those things as well i think when you spend a lot of time with people you've got to like each other i'm sure your study partners the people you spend the most time with who you turn to you like them as people as well yes they're very valuable yes they've got good skills but you've got this kind of synergy between your personalities which is also important for for learning and growing together as well i want to know uh, looking back on your career i know you're still very young you've got lots, lots of good ahead of you looking back on your career is there any moments that have been the most enjoyable for you or the most enjoyable periods that you can reflect on yeah definitely i think uh I think one of them I've mentioned was uh, basically having a success at the live felt for the first time. I really remember that time. Uh, I don't remember, like there are going to be many, many hands and, and, and things that I don't remember about my poker career, but um, like actually like some, some even big achievements that I wouldn't uh, remember like just like that. but. Winning that four hundred dollar at the win for thirty k, I remember it was like I was so happy. Like I, like I, I have that uh, win trophy. It's not even here, so I can't show you. But it's like the basically the win hotel, it's a really nice trophy. And yeah, it was. I I literally can't remember many moments in in my life where I was I was happier than that. Um, it was a big it was a big moment. Um, and then there would be a WSOP bracelet, which was basically the same i was very very happy and it was it was great because it was like free bracelets it was like the tag team event with two of my best friends and it was an amazing experience and like it was my first vegas and like i i, I wasn't even sure i can make it through uh the trip without uh, i don't know without uh having to to go back at some point or having to start selling action or whatever because it could have been uh, very expensive. And then I was sitting there just winning a bunch of tournaments, winning a WSOP brace. It, it was kind of sick. Um, then I've had uh, 
I guess uh, last year I've had uh, so so in cash games I've had the the Imagine King uh, era, like the I would call it era, like two months or something, where I was basically playing the highest games every day, sometimes two three sessions a day. Uh, it was very intense, very good. I had a really good routine, um, and I was really feeling good. Like I was really feeling like I was at top of my game. Uh, feeling good about life, about everything. Um, yeah, it was, it was very happy for me. Um, and yeah, I guess I had a pretty big downswing, uh, like I said, and a lot of it came from MTTs as well. And then I've done a lot of work uh, about MTTs and I have improved a lot. And then last year I've started having a lot of success uh basically had a bunch of final tables in the 10k sunday on gg uh and a bunch of deep runs and good results and i guess that was also pretty fun like having uh every tuesday uh, there would be the the stream i think i've been to the final table like five to ten times um and i would share the link with like friends from home like my parents uh yeah, I even remember there was the one final table where there was like this big uh, Israeli holiday, basically Independence Day. And the final table was that day. And I went to my parents' house. I was with a family. There were like 20 people or something. And then at some point I had to go to my room to play on my laptop. So, and I'm playing on my room and they are watching it downstairs with the delay. So it was pretty sick. Um, so yeah, just... Uh, just that, and I guess if I have to talk about uh, stuff other than poker, I guess uh, it relates to poker, but there was this, I had a lot of trouble with my parents, uh, even when I was making money already and being a professional. But at some point after that Vegas, I got the uh, acknowledgement from my parents that like, it was obviously a process. It was not a one day thing. Oh, like you want a lot of money, you're good. Um, but at some point I realized that like my father became from my biggest, uh, uh, I would say the opposites of supporter to like my biggest fan He's like every day, every session, like how, how is it going? How is it going for you? When am I going to get another link to a final table, blah, 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 all these things. And my mom is like very supportive as well. She's like, you just do your thing. I'm happy for you as long as you're happy and I trust you. And basically my entire family is like that nowadays and it's it it means a lot because i was on the exact other side of it and the feeling was really bad because growing up like uh maybe my my uh, dad was a bit uh, uh, tough as a parent or anything or something like that but it's not like i have bad parents or anything like that it's it's the complete opposite like i've always had really good relationship with my parents and then this happens and I, I really feels like it feels like something is really missing. Uh, something is really painful about it. And then now I, it makes me really happy. It makes me really uh, satisfied. So I'm definitely very happy about that. That's amazing. Yeah, I think it's one of those feelings that most of us have to get some sort of validation, especially from either peer groups or our family or parents. And often when we go down the poker path, we get anything but validation. We get generally told to get back onto the normal job path of life. And very often with this creates a bit of kind of distance between our, our parents, what our parents want from us and what we're doing with our lives. And there's a kind of we're going on different paths of what we see for ourselves. When you have enough success that you have, and I hope the players just listen to this as well, can relate to this. When you have enough success, it almost like merges back and there's a level of acceptance where they stop trying to mold you into what they want you to be and they start to accept you for who you are and they start to uh, let you make your own mistakes, but also uh, they start to have more trust in you. And I think this definitely takes time. No one gets this like a, is a free pass unless you've got very understanding parents, but it sounds like for yourself, like just constant success over time, an attitude of professionalism towards what you're doing. Your parents start to have more and more trust in you and seeing what you're doing. And it comes to a point where they're like, all right, you're on the right path. So yeah, it must've been an amazing moment to get that. So um, did anything change for you in terms of like how you are approaching things? I know sometimes we can go through life with a little bit of a, a point to prove, a bit of a chip on our shoulder. Did anything kind of change for you? Or did you feel different about yourself when your parents in particular started to uh, accept your path and give you a bit more validation for, for the poker pursuit? I think in general, uh, things changed a lot over the last few years, just um, 
not i wouldn't even say um because of my result or anything like that of or what i've i've or what i've achieved in poker because if you ask me i i i think i'm i'm far from uh, digesting all the stuff like i'm i'm not really uh realizing where i am and what i've done um and i think that's okay that's the way i i take these things um and like yeah like i told rene like uh, one of the reasons i i agreed to come here like rene approached me a, a couple of times before i said yes and I went to Vegas this year and I like every table I was sitting in, it's, it seems like everybody knows me. Um, I guess it had a lot to do with like some high stakes tournaments and online games that I played over the last years and, and it just happened. And I kind of liked just being under the radar. I never wanted to be famous or anything like that. Yes, I, I do want to uh, wanna play poker and be very good at it, but my goal was never like to be the best player in the world or like to be the, the most famous one or anything like that. Um, but it just happened that I'm well known. So might as well do the podcast. And I forgot, <laughs> I forgot the main question, what, what it was. <laughs> um, well, we're grateful that you have joined the podcast and are willing to share. So what do you think's changed for you since you have become a bit more well known any sort of things you have to adapt to? Because uh, like you said, you wanted to go under the limelight in general. Anything you have to adapt to, to get more attention on yourself? So yeah, I was saying, uh, I've just done a lot of work on myself as a person and just became much, like my therapist likes to say, I'm, much, I'm a much better friend of Barack than I used to be, um, which for me is, is huge uh, because I've struggled with, with a lot of things uh, mentally. And yeah of course it's still a work in progress but uh yeah i think i've just grown a lot as a person and that's probably uh a big part of of why i made uh of why i've had the the, the big success that i've had as well in poker um so yeah yeah, I think for you as well, it's been very clear how much you've grown both on and off the tables and how they're kind of intertwined along the way in terms of understanding yourself better, the self-awareness, dealing with your emotions. All of these are like things you're dealing with both at the poker tables and away. And yeah, I think for you, it's been, you've been a really great example for our audience of what can happen when you really put the work in on yourself because this stuff's not easy. It's very easy to turn away from the kind of insecurities, the emotions that come up, the pain that you experience as we've talked about and not go into it, not really ex explore it and go, where's this coming from? How do I solve this? How do I get to uh, to know myself better? How do I become a better friend of Barak as your, your therapist said? So I think those are the, the journey that players need to go on to grow. Hopefully people are inspired to go down their own journey if they haven't started already. So yeah, I thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing your journey. I want to ask you about skipping levels. You mentioned like you've basically jumped in at higher levels, especially when you went from MTTs to cash games. What do you think has allowed you to potentially uh, take a few shortcuts and jump in at higher levels? Because I think for some players who may try to replicate what you do, uh, they would maybe fail at the first hurdle, so to speak. But it's quite challenging to uh, miss levels. Often when players go to new formats, they'll start at the, like lower stakes and they'll grind their way to mid stakes and they'll work their way up. You kind of just went kind of straight into a um, uh, I think it was five ten or ten twenty straight away. So you you almost skipped levels. So what what allowed you uh, to jump in at higher levels, and what are some of the skills that you need to learn for that? Okay, so so I will just clarify that um, it's not like uh, one day I decided that I, okay I'm good enough to play five ten I will do it or like I'm good enough to play uh, a five hundred dollar MTT so I can play it and and then it would just worked out. I obviously started from scratch. Um, I, I think I was playing like not very high online entities and basically run it up. Um, and then, I don't know, like playing 50 ABI, 70 ABI, $100 ABI tournaments. And then, I don't know, a bit higher than that. And then started mixing in live. And then obviously like playing, I don't know, maybe 1K ABI live with selling action. And then having success, just basically what I'm, talking about is skipping a bunch of uh, um, things that, uh, along the, uh, I mean, about the road is that I just had a lot of success kind of instantly, not really instantly, but uh, 
relatively fast, uh, much faster, I guess, than the average guy in every format and every bind that I was playing. So let's say, for example, in Israel, there is a, uh, basically, I, I would say almost no uh, Israeli pro that have never been to Bulgaria because Bulgaria is like, uh, there are many live tournaments there. There is, I think the Israeli poker series goes there for like twice a year or something, and or even more than twice. And basically any Israeli player you ask has been, have been there between one to, I don't know, 30 times. And then for me, I've never been there. Why? Because I don't know, I just skipped this. I, I instantly uh, played higher than that. I, I instantly wanted to play higher than that. Um, but it's not because I just decided that I can do it. It's just because I had like the the background to to get me there um, from online and and just uh, yeah I I made some money and was able to do it. Um, and then when I was when I was playing higher live, it all it also worked out. So basically, if you if you think about it, it's kind of like six years almost of uh, sun running. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it's it's something like that. It's it's something like that. At, at least uh, when moving up, because uh, the beginning was very good for me. I guess the first two years, a lot of things worked out really well, and then I've had a lot of money, and I was already uh, very good about a lot of the other stuff about management. So then I was able with my uh, good amount of money not to punt it away. Um, and make smart decisions. So yeah, basically, that's that's about how it happens. It's just like, yeah, I don't know, having the the talent and the skill set to just uh, adjust to any format, any buy-in along the way, uh, whether it's from a, a strategy uh, kind of a, a point of view or like. Uh, management point of view or anything like that yeah also your tolerance for risk is fairly high so you're able to uh, almost like roll with these good patches and put yourself in higher games as a kind of byproduct of that and also i think you've got a very good balance where you're able to deal with anything that happens anyway so it's not like you're going in these games hoping that it run, goes well obviously a lot of your shot takes have went well early on uh, but i mean if you get lucky long enough it's no longer luck it's one of those things where you, you've got certain factors that are going your way but also you were able to uh, handle any risk that you took on obviously there would have been challenges if things didn't go your way uh, but able to recalibrate so yeah i think for you it's even though we, we talk about being quick, it has, relatively quick we're talking about, it's still been many years of progression, many years of leveling up. Um, and yeah, for you, you've just been able to uh, move faster than most people due to yeah, a lot of things we've discussed today. How about yourself, Rene? How do you feel like your journey was relatively in terms of being able to take risks? Were you able to skip any levels or did you do a linear buy-in buy -buy uh, pursuit? Very linear, starting at the uh, free rules, 10 and L, 25 and L, 15 L, 100 and L, 200 and L, you name it. Just slowly, slowly up the stakes. Definitely way less uh, risk taking, way more risk averse, always playing it safe, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, definitely not like Barrack, but I definitely feel like it's something that in hindsight, looking back, I, I, I should have probably worked on because I definitely feel like I left out uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of EV by not being more aggressive. But to be fair, also very early in my career, going pro. Basically, after I decided to sort of go pro, stop study. I think it took me four months to go broke. So that left, <laughs> I think, also quite a big dent. Like I, I was, I was definitely a bit more risk averse after that. Uh, actually, I think it happened twice even. So then at some point I was like, okay, I'm not gonna play high stakes anymore because, or at least that back then it was, I think. Maybe 10, 20, where I think I lost a lot. 5, 10, 10, 20. I was like, okay, I'll just, uh, I'll just grind to four, you know? And then to be fair, and, and that's, it, I remember also looking looking back, that has such a huge compound effect because basically I got broke, then I had to get a stake, have to give away, uh, you know, a big part of your profit. And then if you look at the compound of that, then I didn't, I was risk averse. So I didn't want to play 5, 10 or 10, 20. So I was just grinding it back on two, four, grinded everything back, but also I have to give, uh, uh, a part of your winnings away. So if I look at it, the amount of money that going broke early cost me, it's uh, and being risk averse. So that experience cost me a lot of money. 
I, I don't want to calculate exactly how much, but if you compound, it, it was quite a lot. Uh, I was I was curious, uh, Barak, what do you think is the most important lesson that poker has taught you? Hmm. I don't know about a good and lesson rather than just experiences. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've talked about it a few times by now but it's just yeah it's just like poker is like life there is many 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 similarities you just have to pay attention and yeah it, it just gives you like uh i just told my friend the other day where like um i was offered some kind of deal and and eventually uh, i didn't want to go through with it because i felt like something uh was a bit shady or something about it. And and then I told him, like, I, I have a feeling that for a 27 year old guy that, you know, my my job is not to socialize with people and, and uh, yeah, I'm not like a detective at the police or anything like that. I have a pretty good sense of uh, uh, like understanding how people operate and, and what uh, motivates them and, and things like that. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, maybe it's not like a lesson that I've learned, but just a, a lot of experience, um, a lot of like unexpected experience that uh, I wouldn't say appears, but it's just it's it's out there. Um, yeah, you would say you you developed this skill through your experience dealing with poker, especially life. Yeah, yeah. You. I would say to most people's definition of success are a very successful poker player. What is your definition of success? That's a, that's a very good question. You just brought a smile to my face because there is a, my favorite rapper nowadays. His name is NF and he has two songs where he's, uh, where he starts with what's, what's your definition of success. So it's, uh, oh, really? yeah, it's, it's a really good one. Um, I think my definition of success is uh, so you you guys should look it up. It's 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 pretty good. <laughs> so it's uh, I think it's uh, first of all doing what you like. Like I can't imagine what I would be doing if I wasn't playing poker. Like there is literally, I got a really really tempting job offer last year, doing something completely different, getting paid a lot of money. Uh, I'm not sure if it would have been more money that I'm making, but it would have been with no risk. So, and it could be much higher at some point. Um, but I said no, and it was a pretty easy decision just because like, I don't know. I, to, I think I had to commit for like one year or something. And I said like, there is no way, like I'm just not going to stop playing, playing poker right now. There's just... This is what I love to do. It doesn't have to do with money. It doesn't have to do with the risks. This is just who I am, um, at least for, for a while now. Maybe at one point I will want to stop, but right now I don't see myself ever doing anything different. And this is the first thing. And the second thing is just like being happy, just like being, making sure like, okay, this is who I am and this is what I want to do, but am I happy? And of course, like we all have uh, bad faces, we all have like ups and downs, uh, but always trying to uh, to reach that happiness, like trying to do more and more things, uh, wherever they are related to poker or not, and most of them are not related to poker at all. Um, yeah, just try and doing more of that and, and and being happy. So yeah, just doing what you like as long as you can afford to do it and. Yeah, trying to be happy, trying to be a good person, trying to have, like, I can definitely say I, I've met a lot of good people along the way. I have a great family. I have great friends from all over the world, um, which I am, I feel really blessed for. Um, and yeah, definitely uh, have uh, some steps uh, to climb in order to get that happiness. But I'm definitely uh, on the way there and I'm, and I'm happy for it. Adam, you have any final questions you would like to ask uh, Barak before I let him go? 
No, I'd like to thank Barak for his time. I know you were in two minds whether to join us on the podcast and Renny had to twist your arm a few times. So we appreciate you for joining us and our audience is going to really take a lot of wisdom from this conversation. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you guys. That was, that was very nice. Thank you a lot, Barak, for coming on and sharing all your wisdom that you acquired through this journey. Adam, what were your main takeaways from Barak's story? Yeah, very inspired by Breck's story and his journey from the DGen, which we started the conversation with, to the high stakes player that he is today, and all the lessons he learned along the way. And I really liked how he went back and forth, linking lessons he was learning in poker to how it was impacting his life. And one of the big takeaways for me was the skill of self-awareness and realizing, wait a second, I've got loads of traits and triggers and things that are happening at the poker tables. I need to do some work to address those. So he worked with a therapist, he did a lot of self-reflecting, and he started to realize that emotions were coming up over and over as he's playing and things were triggering him. And he did a lot of work to understand where they're coming from. And I really liked to, like the place he ended up, ended up at the end where he talked about experiencing emotions, feeling emotions and being with them. And also like being with the pain. I tried to really go deep into a few topics for him and go, how do you, how do you experience pain? How do you process it? And it's really interesting how he, he first of all acknowledged that I, I'm just with it. I experience pain, I experience the emotion as it's there. And then he talked about how he uses the mind to kind of reframe stuff and come up with kind of coping strategies, how we talk to friends to relay information to them, and then how he reminds himself of where he's at. So all these kind of skills he's learning to, uh, to deal with the adversity of being a poker player. And I think it was a, a really good conversation about both the, the good side of poker and the challenging parts of it where things get tough and you do experience a lot of negative emotions. He also mentioned forgiving himself and that his therapist said he's a better better friend to Barak, which I thought was really nice because I think a lot of players I speak with have perfectionist traits. They want to do everything right. They want to make sure they don't make mistakes and they fight against this um, urge to want to be perfect. And very often that drive to want to be perfect creates a lot of emotions, creates a lot of tension, creates a lot of frustration. And the only solution is to uh, Give yourself permission to make mistakes, forgive yourself, be kind to yourself. I think you mentioned, Rene, have more empathy towards yourself. These are the only kind of solutions to that problem. Not to not make mistakes, because that's like uh, never going to happen. Other thing I really liked about the conversation is the approach to risk. Very, uh, I'd say not unique, but a very um, kind of high tolerance to risk, we could call it, where he definitely goes for a more, let's take on a lot of risk. And he mentioned the factors that led to that in terms of his life circumstances, his bankroll, his uh, commitments in life overall. And then also, which I thought was really important, how he can handle uh, risk, he can handle when things go badly, because that's the kind of double-edged sword. If you want to go uh, high risk, high reward, you're also going for the high bad side, high downsides when things don't go your way. And you've got to be able to deal with that from a mindset perspective, from a almost like a self-doubt perspective and be able to handle that. And he uh, has definitely perfected that skill set. I worked on those tools that when things go really badly, he can work himself through that. He can get back out of it. So uh, he's able to put himself in these high risk, high reward scenarios without breaking down. Now the takeaway that came across for many topics was finding what works for you, find what works for yourself within those frameworks. If you guys try to repeat everything Barak does, I'm sure you'll find some obstacles. So it's, it's finding your own kind of path with the kind of um, guidelines that uh, were mapped out today. So yeah, really, really in-depth. I think we covered a lot of really good topics and yeah, looking forward to uh, watching this back myself. How about yourself, Rene? What were some of the main takeaways for you? The main things that uh, stood out to me from a technical perspective were definitely the answers that he gave around what do you think common leaks are. Another thing that he talked a lot about was live. Pay attention, okay? It's live, especially if you're an online player. It's a very different game. And he mentioned let's say for example online players it's way more common that they will randomize so your decision within a range might be plus 3 bb plus minus 3 bb for example whereas in life where pe things are way less randomized people either always have it or never have it making a decision or making good decisions or negative decisions usually costs you way more money and again that comes down to um life because people don't randomize, you have a way accurate, you can get a way more accurate view of what villain's range actually is. So it kind of ties hand in hand with the first part. And just the fact that your decision making process playing at that level, it will be way different than the decision making process that Barrack probably has when he plays three, four handed against some of the best in the world. Okay. This is also definitely something they mentioned. Well, I, when I go play live poker, I have to kind of switch my brain. It's a completely different environment. The way or the things that are taken in consideration when making decisions is completely different. My decision-making process is not the same. 
And if you keep your decision-making process the same life, you will not get the desired results, as I think also something that he pointed out. And uh, at last, I wrote down how much mistakes are technical mistakes because he observed that a lot of the problems that players usually have is not their off-game knowledge, but it's their in-game performance. So if you want to know if this is the case, reflect on the amount of mistakes that you make and see if in hindsight you immediately know what the correct play actually is. Uh, because that usually indicates more of a performance mistake. Now, it could be that you just overcomplicated your strategy or you don't know your strategy good enough and therefore you make mistakes when playing, but then look for what are kind of triggers that happen or what kind of emotional state was I in when making this mistake and what triggered that emotional state because then you can work on the trigger. This is something, for example, that Adam uh, puts a lot of work in in his coaching as well, uh, which I think is very beneficial. Now, if you want to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career and basically learn a lot of the things or go deeper in a lot of the things that we actually discussed today in this podcast, um, Mechanics of Poker 2.0 program currently open for applications. Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com, apply to the program. Maybe you will get selected to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. I'm also curious what your main takeaways were. Leave the comments down below. GTO Wizard, our sponsor, will pick one of the comments and you will get one month for free. GTO Wizard. If you like this pot, do like it. Please share it with a friend. Subscribe to the channel and turn notifications on so you don't miss the next episode. We have a lot of good episodes coming up, so stay tuned. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank Barrack again. I want to thank Adam for co-hosting this pot. And I see you guys in the next episode.